Face is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down Here. It's a Thursday, so we're taking your Thursday thoughts on a lot of different things. Uh, we've got negotiations. We've got teams who can't score goals. We've got a FIFA Club World Cup match going on right now involving a team that is known pretty well in this part of the world, T Grace. We've got Barcelona making epic comebacks. We've got chatter back and forth between Barcelona and PSG. We've got a problem with a match ball or somebody in a bench area or something in the Club World Cup. Um, All kinds of stuff going on this morning. So you want to join that conversation? It might be risky, but go for it. You can tweet at us at Soccer Down Here. You can join the Twitch pitch, twitch.tv slash Soccer Down Here. You can also email us soccer down here at gmail no we're not doing a three-hour show dm tim no not yet not yet we're getting there not yet not yet we got to work on a format we got to figure this out because if i talk for three hours i might not be able to talk for the rest of the day so we will figure that out as we go but i guess john we have to start with the mls situation um Tofka liked the super heavy bass on the intro. Yes, I don't know why it was it. super heavy. I have no idea. Um, it, it's weird. Squirrels and groundhogs and who knows what are, are causing things with internet connections. But nobody has caused a breakthrough in the negotiations just yet. And it depends on who you're reading on Twitter as to have a sense of where things stand with the MLS negotiations between the league and the Players Association. Uh, You would get a tweet with an unnamed player saying, well, I think there's some owners who don't even want to play, which doesn't make a lot of sense because there were signings made yesterday and there's more signings reported to be made today, but okay. And then you would get a tweet with, well, there's a lot of activity. Okay. What does that mean exactly? Nobody really knows. Um, Where things stand from a a news perspective, and and we try to make it very clear. First off, FIFA needs to make it very clear about their match balls for the Club World Cup. Man, they still have a problem with this thing. This is ridiculous. Um, Get better air pumps in in Qatar. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah. So we try to stay where we know news is and, and not misinformation and disinformation because there's a lot of that going on and there's a lot of maybe intentional shading of things and and I don't know why I don't I really don't understand it because look whether you are team MLSPA and 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 you're standing for them or or your team MLS and and you've got a Don Garber poster on your wall nobody wins with any of this like, that's the thing, is that there's nothing to be rooting for with what's going on. Nobody's happy. Nobody is, is satisfied. Nobody's getting anything they want right now. So there's no reason to pick a side in this way. It makes no sense, and it's counterproductive. And yes, when people of influence do it, it hurts the discourse. And it's a problem. Here's what we know. The MLSPA has rallied the support, um, whether they did it or the league's, I think, ill-timed threat of a lockout did it. They've got the support of the NFLPA, the MLBPA, the NBAPA, uh, I believe the NWSLPA, the WNBAPA. I think the only one I haven't seen is the NHL. I, I think they have the support of all the major leagues in this country as we try to correct the sound issues because I know it's a little loud all right maybe that'll sound a little bit better um it's it's just bizarre it's really bizarre to me so you've got that going on and that's legit 
That is absolutely legit. And that, I think, does affect the way this plays out. I do, because look, the PR's changed. The, the PR battle has changed. I think the league lost the PR battle with using the word lockout in a release when it was unnecessary. They didn't have to do it because, okay, let's play the game. Let's, let's play a hypothetical game here. They don't come to an agreement by midnight. The league said they are authorized to declare a lockout at that point. They didn't say they would. I think maybe they finally got the match ball situation going in the sixth minute in, in the Club World Cup. It's insane. Um, they're authorized to. They didn't say they were definitely doing it, but that was the implied threat. Let's say they do. Let's say that's the, the announcement Friday morning is that they are locking the players out. Well, what are they locking them out of right now, actually, anyway? Training camps don't open until the 22nd. I, I guess where players are able to use team facilities in case of recovering from injuries or for their own personal workouts, I, I guess maybe that. Yeah. That's really about it. It's a paper lockout. So if... You can't get a deal done because both sides have negotiated in bad faith at different points of this. There's just no way around it. Nobody is, has handled this perfectly. The players didn't want to negotiate, period. The players then slow-walked the response to the proposal from the league. Then they gave it, and it was a good one, and it was a good response that probably could have been given weeks before and would have sped this up, but it wasn't. The league then has botched the response to that. Both sides have made massive mistakes in this. But the PR battle, and maybe that's why you have what's going on in, in the social media world and the American soccer media world and all that. Look, it's turned against the league. And that does factor in. The league has to take that into consideration. If they lock the players out, even on paper, even for a week, which doesn't really affect anything because you could solve it by next week, and it's a paper lockout of a few days when nobody was actually kept from a facility unless they were going in to work out on their own. There's still damage because of that threat and because of the way the PR has shifted. The league gains nothing by doing it at this point. The players aren't gaining anything right now either, in my opinion, because a potential stoppage of play is going to be really damaging to a large number of players. Not all. There's some who would be able to live on their savings and be fine. There's some who would know that everything would work out if they had to force their, their way into a move or what have you. There's a lot who wouldn't. And I think that a, a, a should be a huge consideration for the Players Association. We've went through it. We're not going to keep rehashing it. You know, there, There's losses. There's huge losses. There's giant losses. Um, the league is not at a risk right now of going out of business because of those losses. But, yeah, it's incredibly damaging to lose as much money as they did last year. And look at losing more this year. Now, how much? Nobody knows. You know, There's been rapid progress on some fronts with the vaccine. There's also fear with these mutations and these other things that are going on with the virus that we don't necessarily know what it's going to do yet. So the idea of more losses this year is not in any way unfounded, in my opinion. You're about 50 to $70 million apart from what we know in terms of the league wanted to save this amount by adding two years onto the CBA. The players have agreed to one year with some moving parts about free agency and about salary cap numbers, great. You're about $50, $70 million apart. You're one year apart in adding to the CBA. That does not feel like it's far apart, as the league has said, which is another area that I think the league did not need to add that to it because that's going to be used against them. Get it done. And we know they've talked. We know they talked yesterday. We know that some people who have been very vocal about this and I think getting one side of the story said they haven't heard anything. So I take that as a good sign. I do think that the way this played out, and this is my opinion, this is my speculation, I know nothing about it. I think the league putting deadlines on things forced the players into action because they weren't getting any action. 
now the reverse has happened. I think the Players Association taking advantage of the league's misstep on the lockout threat is forcing the league into action. And whichever one ends up being the thing that drives it or both, good. Because the inaction was disrespectful to the game and to all the people involved in it. Both sides need to be bigger than this. And I really hope they can solve it without more damage. The, the damage thing right now is way overstated, in my opinion. These are two cliques that are sniping at each other in a high school cafeteria right now. Until there's a lockout and until a calendar is affected, it's sniping. You're not going to remember it in, in five years. You will, you will remember the feelings of it when they negotiate again at the end of the CBA. You won't remember the details. If games are missed, yeah, it's going to be a problem. Um, if the season has to be shortened because you start the season later, it's going to be a problem. You have room in your calendar as it's currently constructed to still make everything work, even with a slight delay. It's not necessary because... You have opportunities here to bounce back quicker if you take advantage of them. And you look at some of the signings that MLS is linked to right now. Some good signings, some smart signings for the future, some young players with promise. Um, You've got some players who have moved on loan, good business, you want more of that. You're in a good position to bounce back. Don't do anything to risk it. And that's on the league. And if it's 50 50 million bucks, it's 70 million bucks. And you say, man, we've got to have that. We've got to save that money somewhere. Well, right now you're going to save it in 2027 is what you're saying. You're going to save it in the 27 season. You can't, can't explain to me how you could make 50 to 70 million in sales between now and 2027 that you wouldn't have made before that would make up for that. I'm not buying that. You can do that. Um, and... I think that's where it is now. I think the players' proposal, counter-proposal, is what was needed a week or two after the original proposal. And if that had happened, I don't think we'd be here today. I think we're here because both sides have been arrogant. I think we're here because both sides have used the media as sounding boards, which hasn't helped the discourse at all. And I think we're here because both sides are being selfish in a lot of ways for different reasons and different things. But... It's not helping anything because if there is a lockout, the players don't win anything. The owners don't win anything. They save a little bit of short-term money. They're going to do some damage to themselves. If there's not a lockout and the players get everything they want, they're still giving something back because of where we are, because it's, it's a pandemic. Nobody's winning right now. Mitigate the losses and move on. And that's where it stands now. I would assume that the usual folks out in the media will have things to say about this. I hope it's facts. I hope it's not a bunch of opinion. And I hope it's not trying to drive things in a certain direction because there's been way too much of that. It's really disappointing. I hope that both sides are not focused on it. I hope both sides are focused on getting a deal done because there is no value to any kind of a stoppage. And we'll see what happens. I mean, there's a lot of speculation right now about where things stand. You've got less than 24 hours It doesn't feel like you're that far apart. Get it done. Just get it done. There are points of view that vary. Is it the fact that you're not hearing anything is a good thing? Is it the fact that you're not hearing anything is a bad thing? And like I said, honestly, it depends on who you talk to, who you follow, what you read, as to what that opinion is. In some instances... A lot of folks will sit there and say, okay, because we have, because there is a, because there is radio silence, they're getting things done. Some folks will say the exact opposite. One of the points that was brought across in the last couple of days is that uh, the owners don't want a season and they're not doing anything to get toward a 2021 season. But if they're signing players, if they're bringing players under the tent, then to me that's a sign that the teams want to have a season, that these clubs want to have a season, if they're bringing players in. You can't tell me they don't want to have a season if you're signing players yesterday. Right. 
And to see something like that, it's counterintuitive to have that point of view if you're seeing players being signed. So, and I don't know what it is. I mean, this goes back as far as I can remember when it comes to key labor negotiations across the board. It could be the Teamsters, it could be air traffic controllers, it could be whatever. But there's always this notion that's attached that the deadline gets things moving wherever that has happened. And it has happened in the past. We're Frankly, all I'm just procrastinators. Hoping, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like you're cramming for a test, you wait till the last minute to get the project done. You know, it's like the the diorama that you're trying to build when you're like in third or fourth grade. You wait until the bitter end. Have you done your homework? No, I haven't. When's it due? Tomorrow. And then your parents come in and you they help you get the project done, those kinds of things. So that's where, once again, traditionally, I think we are as a country in this particular situation. But get it done. There are there's too much to lose on both sides. Both sides have erred in this whole thing in the 30 day window, the 37 days that we're mm-hmm. looking at it right now. So, all right, you've aired, focus, get it done, move on, let's get, let's get moving. Yeah, Tafka says the, the problem is that the World Cup boom comes in 2027. It's debatable when it comes, and we don't really know what it'll be at this point. Both sides want a bigger piece of that. That's why one year seems to be a sticking point between the parties. And, and where things stand right now, from what both sides have said, the league wanted the CBA to be extended through the 2027 season, which would mean 2028 would be the first year with a new CBA. The players didn't want that initially. They did agree to extending it through the 2026 season, which would mean they'd be negotiating after the World Cup, you would expect, because we're all procrastinators. And they're going to wait till the CBA is done and do it in the off season of 26-27, a few months after the World Cup. You could argue both sides of it, to be honest, and I don't know how it plays out. Um, I know from research in 94, and look, it's a very different situation. In 94, early in the calendar year of 1994, there was a lot of talk about how the World Cup was not going to meet its projections in terms of revenue. Um it was going okay, but they weren't going to hit their numbers in terms of the projections. That led MLS to slow down a little bit as it was coming together. Remember, MLS kind of came out of the 94 World Cup. It was part of the bid process to start a new Division One league. They had to kind of slow things down a little bit. Well, then, as you got closer to the World Cup, boom. You had a huge World Cup. You had huge sales. You made a lot more money than you projected. And you were able to, one, start the U.S. Soccer Foundation with that money. You were also able to make a loan to MLS to help them get off the ground and really get things going. But that came after. Now, in 26, we don't know. Is it going to be something that we don't know exactly what it's going to do until a few months before the tournament? And then, in some ways, pushing the CBA back helps the players. I can buy that argument that having it in 26, and I, I think it's probably part of their thinking, and this is my speculation on it, you know then, if you're at the end of 25, and you've got ticket sales that are meh, you know, you've got the international audience coming to the States for this, it kind of, oh, well, it's only a few years after COVID, we don't really know if we want to travel, eh, You've got sponsors, you've got things that are kind of wishy-washy. The way it was originally structured, if you negotiated a new CBA going into 26, you might not know what the World Cup's going to do. You're coming from more unknown. By pushing it back a year, you're in a better spot. Pushing it back two is a whole different thing. And it could be too far. could absolutely be too far. The players feel it is. I think the one year is, is fair because you're negotiating after the World Cup is completed. You know what it's done in terms of revenues coming in. And look, the World Cup's not being run by MLS. I think maybe there's a little bit of a confusion there. The boom is not direct. Like, it's not, oh, MLS is going to make all this money off the World Cup directly. It's like guerrilla marketing in a way. You know, it, when there's a World Cup and Coca-Cola is the official sponsor of the World Cup. 
you better bet Pepsi's doing some things around the World Cup to find their way in the door and to make money off of it. It's going to be the same thing. The World Cup's going to be in this country. MLS is going to find ways to make money on the World Cup being here. You're going to have sponsors that are engaged in the game and are going to say, hey, that World Cup went really, really well for us. How can we continue with the soccer audience? Oh, yeah, we can get into the league. Cool, done. But it's, it's all a lot of if, then, now we've got this. And you don't know what it is yet. So pushing it back a year, I think, helps the players. To be perfectly yeah. honest, I think negotiating at the end of the 26 season is better than negotiating at the end of 25. Okay, going a further year, I understand the logic and not wanting that. On the league side, yeah, you, in some ways, might have been able to get a better deal if you negotiated pre-World Cup. Now you're wanting to push it further past the World Cup where you've been able to put things in place and you've been able to gain and not share quite as much of the revenue. Well, now you can't do that. You know, in some ways, maybe the league would have been better to negotiate in 25, but they want to save money. That's why the, like, the, the stories around this are not telling the whole story. Like The stories around it and what he said once and this and that, it's complicated. There's not an easy flowchart of it's just about salary savings. No, there's lots of different elements to it. I don't know how it plays out. I don't, but I think the players are in a better spot negotiating after the World Cup than before. Because if I'm the league before the World Cup, how do, how do you do these things, right? You say, well, you know, we're not seeing a lot of a bump yet. We're not really seeing you know, any gains as of yet from this. The gains are going to come during and after. And I think by the end of the 26th season, and they're going to do what they always do. They're not going to negotiate until the 26th season is done. They're going to push it as deep as possible. They're going to have every bit of information on what the World Cup made, what the effect of, of growth in the league has been. They're going to have all that by that time. So you're going to have all the information when they negotiate. They will wait as late as they can go into the 27th season to do it. Okay, I, it seems fair to me. It yeah. seems fair. It's a better spot than either one that has been proposed. So move forward. The league needs to find 50 to 70 million to save. You can do that in different ways. You could even do that by doing more of what we saw in this window. Paul Ariola, Jordan Morris, Brian Rodriguez. These teams making that money back by making these kinds of deals and sales, and moving forward. It can be done. 50 to 70 is not an insurmountable number. So, get it done. Get it done. Por favor. Uh, Jared Smith is in with us this morning. Uh-oh, for... that's dangerous. I know. So, uh, Jared, once again, as a nation of procrastinators, we're now dealing with it with Major League Soccer. What do you think? Oh, hold on. Hold Jeff on. Carlisle's tweeted, I'm um, told the two sides had talks... I uh, had discussions throughout the day yesterday, but one source says there's, quote, still a long way to go. MLS still pushing for the two-year extension through 27, though it's not the only issue being discussed. Get through the long way. You got less than 24 hours. Just do it. Sorry, Jared. No, I came on because I was happy because my large adult son's in Major League Soccer now. Yeah, because Montreal's expecting to play this season, I would assume. And so is uh, mm-hmm. Bjorn Johnson. Yorn Mars Johnson, late of uh, Hearts of Midlothian. And late of uh, uh, Ulsan Hyundai, who he could be playing in a Club World Cup match right now against Tigres, but he has chosen and, to go to Montreal. And he could be playing with a lead because they just scored. Well, I'll just remind you who picked uh, Ulsan Hyundai to win this game. That'd be me. would me. That'd be me. Just saying. I don't think it was me. It was me. Yeah, no. Um... Yeah, so Johnson had six goals in 34 games for Hearts, then went to the Dutch the, the Dutch League, where all good attackers go to thrive, played for Den Haag, and scored 19 goals in 34 games. Um, 29 years old, he, huge a striker, like 6'5", much faster than you think he is. Um, I'm excited for Montreal, because he's, he's a Norwegian international, but he was born in New York. Uh, there was talk like six years ago, like he might be one to watch for if USA needs a striker, and he had a playing for Norway and he's doing okay for himself um I'm just happy he's here because he was really fun to watch in Scotland for that little amount of time because there was just this uh basically it was a deer on the field running around uh, and it was very amusing to me as far as the uh as far as the discussion goes for the unions and for the league please get it done um I 
just don't want the headache that comes with you know, just comes with a lockout, even if it doesn't impact games where um, where we get eighty five thousand opinion pieces written and all of it sucks and all of it does suck because nobody seems to be capable of going through this negotiation without putting their foot squarely in their mouth or doing something really annoying or dumb at some point. I mean, to your point, um, I like, I like the proposal of the union put, I don't know why you had to wait till the 11th hour to give it to the owners. I don't know why you couldn't give it to them two weeks earlier from that could have been negotiating longer. And then we wouldn't be stressing out about y'all waiting to the last minute, like a seventh grader trying to turn in a project that you had six weeks to work on. Just turn it in earlier. Go to the table with them. If you got to take a battle axe to the table, cool. But at least give yourself more time to get the killing out of the way. Or fix the instead, table. One or the other. Instead, yeah, instead now we're up against it now, less than 24 hours. And just, uh, I had enough doom and gloom in my life when I look around the entire planet. The fact that, you know, we're still in a lockdown, basically, where we are limiting what we're going to do. I don't need more doom and gloom because Major League Soccer's players and owners both decided they wanted to be middle schoolers. I got enough doom and gloom without y'all getting up in your feelings. There's a lot of that. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, On the MLS front, on rosters and such, because there is a lot going on at the moment for a league that I guess doesn't want to play, according to some. Um, Jarrett mentioned uh, Bjorn Johnson from Ulsan Hyundai. Two-year deal, option for 23. It's a TAM deal. Uh, He's an interesting player, uh, born in New York, so he's not going to count as an international. He's played in... Let me see if I can get all of these in a quick (laughs) run. He moved to Norway, born in New York, spent his formative years in North Carolina, Moved to Norway, joined Valerenga's youth teams, uh, made his debut in the second division, moved to Spain, then Portugal, then Bulgaria, then Hearts in Scotland, then Den Haag in, in the Netherlands, then Rosenborg in Norway, then Olsen Honda in South Korea. That's a well-traveled career that passport is full and a lot also there's a good there's a really good record for american strikers who go thrive in uh in in the dutch league and then eventually find their way to major league soccer to have good careers hey josie how you doing yeah in canada of all places well i don't know about american strikers who have played in scotland bulgaria norway and the netherlands who then come to Canada. That just means he's seen some things. He's seen some things. He's seen some things. He's, he's seen that, played that some, pickled shark. I, I, I also will not question his toughness credentials for playing in those leagues. Oh, for sure. Um, also on players who have spent time in Scotland, uh, Cameron Harper of Celtic, who made his debut not too long ago with the first team, it appears, according to the Daily Record in Scotland, that the New York Red Bulls have agreed to a fee with Celtic to bring Cameron Harper to the United States. 19 years old. They were going to sign him on a pre-contract, and he joined in the summer. But they've managed to do a deal that, that both sides are happy with. It can't be much money, if any, you know, whatever the situation is, because he's walking for a free in the summer. So uh, maybe a few cases of a new flavor of Red Bull. Maybe Celtic gets to sample it before anybody else. But he's a USU 20. He will be in camp for the Red Bulls. What do you think about Cameron Harper, Jared? I think Cameron Harper got kind of a raw deal, which isn't a unique situation with the youngsters in Scotland right now at Celtic. Um, He got one start, and it was when half the team was in quarantine coming back from Dubai. It wasn't a great start. There were one or two moments where he, he had one or two moments, but... Um, wasn't great overall. It was also like 30 degrees and raining. Like it was a freezing rain. The field was bad and they were playing a team that basically shelled up defensively and decided if you came in the attacking third, we're just going to kick you. Um, so it was hard. It was hard to like 
to write like a full scouting report about the dude because the situations and the game itself were so weird and disjointed. The lineup was just slapped together with paper mache and some uh, some Elmer's glue. It's you can tell he's got some talent. You can tell he's got some good ideas, especially when he gets outside one on one. But it's hard to take something away from that game. Um, you can say, and I think it's accurate to say, like that wasn't a great game for him. It's also fair to say the situation sucked. The weather sucked. The field wasn't great. And the other team didn't really come out to play a ton. So good on him for you know making a move to Red Bulls where I would imagine he's going to get more time on the field because that wasn't happening with Celtic. Yeah. They also have uh, Oko Flex and uh, Karamoko Dembele, a name people had heard three years ago when he was like 15 years old playing with the second team. Uh, neither one of them really seemed to have taken the jump in terms of in terms of development. Well, there's a manager a there who doesn't seem to. There's a manager there who doesn't really seem to worry too much about development or making sensical decisions. True, that's accurate. Um, development doesn't seem to be really a big thing right now. So, good on him, Celtic. If they, I mean, Celtic found him through scouting, and so they're going to make a little bit of money off of him. Good on you for that. I'm sure you'll reinvest it wisely. You won't. Um, They'll give the cases a Red Bull to Scott Brown. Oh man. Actually, he won't drink it. Um, he's on the record as, like, he's ADHD in a big way. Like, he, he, he won't drink sugary drinks because it gets him too hyperactive. That's the, for the best. Yeah, please don't do that, Scott yeah. Brown. So he's very, uh, <laughs> I don't know if he's still the case, but he used to be very uh, picky about what he ate and drank because too much sugar would have him bouncing off the walls, even as an adult. So he's very self-conscious about that. That's a, that's a frightening um, concept that it could get worse. Got a bouncing off the wall, <laughs> Scott Brown. Yeah, I know, not right? Good. Not good. Um, Especially back when he was like really good playing as an eight and playing box to box and literally just doing wind sprints for ninety minutes from box to box, it was amazing. When he was when he was good, it was amazing to watch because he was, was all jacked up on crunk juice. <laughs> Probably was. <laughs> Probably knocking back rock stars or yeah, I don't know, like the really bad uh, stuff. Oh, he was buying yeah. like the the really like weird Nos off energy. brand stuff. There it is, Nos Energy. Yeah, Nos Energy. There you go. Um, so Red Bulls are looking um, to bring I'm in... I'm glad for Harper that he's getting a chance to come to America and in, in, a, in a situation where he will get time and he will get a chance. He's young. That's good. He's young. He's 19. Um, I mean, I, I would assume, just based off what we know about how Red Bulls recruit, that maybe they see him as somebody that could develop on in the Red Bull organization and, and maybe make a jump to a club like Salzburg. He's 19. It could happen. Um, let's see what he does in New York couple of rumors uh, that are not quite as far along as that one. Sporting Kansas City, according to AM670, a Velez Sarsfield radio program in Buenos Aires, they are reportedly putting in an offer for Velez center back Lautaro Gianetti. Uh, 27 years old, he's valued at $2.2 million, according to Transfer Marked. He has played... Over 100 games for Velez. That's where he developed. So he's been there since he started. Uh, according to Transfer Mark, he's under contract through the summer of 2022. It'd be a nice addition. I think he's been linked to Kansas City before. It would be a very nice addition as they try to upgrade defensively. And Peter Vermes uh, tries to get Sporting Kansas City back into a, a title race situation. They've been around it, but they haven't been able to, to get that deal done since 2013. We'll see if Giannetti can help them with that. Uh, one with a player who is involved with a club that is playing right now, uh, Carlos Salcedo of Tigres, is a linked, according to ESPN in Mexico, with a move to the Houston Dynamo, which would be a very smart move from a PR perspective as well for the Dynamo. Um, we'll see if they can get that one done. Of course, nothing would have happened until this is done for Tigres, uh, the Club World Cup. And right now, they are trailing 1-0 in the 35th minute. Uh, I believe some people are watching on an even longer delay. So we'll be a little more careful about the spoiler alerts, John. Okay. Just saying. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, watching, I'm watching on Fox Deportes, so I'm in the 35th. John, no spoiler alerts. Por favor. Why uh, not? The one thing we can say is that Tuca Ferretti is not happy about what's going on right now. Uh, yeah. Tigres has had some issues with positive COVID tests. They, they had some players. I know Nahuel Guzman, their goalkeeper, at one point wasn't going to be able to play. Um, he is able to play. Uh, Mataflo wanted to know where we could watch this. 
It's only on Fox. Fox has both the English and Spanish. So it's on FS2. Two. two. And it's on Fox Deportes. So Two Day NA does not have the rights to this. FS2 and Fox Deportes. Um, the other thing that is out there, and we talked about it a little bit on stoppage time over at 92.9 The Game's Facebook page yesterday, Barnsley and the Daryl DK situation. Now, the reports when that deal was announced, which surprised everybody, was that it was a $20 million purchase option at the end, and Barnsley doesn't spend that kind of money. Uh, Doug O'Kane of the Barnsley Chronicle spoke to Dane Murphy, who's the CEO at Barnsley, who has worked in MLS with Rail Salt Lake and D.C. United. Murphy confirmed there's a buy option. He said it would be a similar price to many deals they've done recently. He also confirmed that Orlando have a recall option if he's not playing games. The quote there is, but it's easy to meet. So he will probably be playing for Barnsley, and they won't recall him automatically because he's not playing. The biggest recent fee that Barnsley has spent is $1.5 million. So one point five twenty. Hmm. There's Something a got lost in the translation. Moved there. Yeah, I don't think that's the pounds to, to U.S. dollars uh, conversion. I, I don't know how that one made any sense when it was uh, brought out this way. So let's wait and see. Uh, DK, $1.5 does not feel like enough. If it's more in the... Five to six region, I'd even still question it just a little bit because I, I think DK's a, a talent who could go for more than that with another year or so. Uh, but that's up to Orlando because they do have other forwards. And you want to play a black helicopter on it? And I know, Jarrett, you like to play black helicopters. You like to fly the black helicopters from time to time. <laughs> Sydney LaRue signed a new three-year deal with the Orlando Pride. Now, you're, you might ask if you don't know why we're talking about that in conjunction with Orlando's forward situation. Wow. Her husband is Dom Dwyer, and he is out of contract, and he last played for Orlando. Does he stay in Orlando on a new deal? Because now Sydney has signed a new deal for the Pride. It, it is a fairly decent flight plan to try to follow if you are into such things like black helicopters. Uh, LaRue, 30 years old, three-year deal, option for an additional year. Uh, she did say, you know, she'd love to get back into the national team, but that's for Vlatko Andonovsky to sort out. She just wants to get back playing. 93 games in seven seasons with five different teams. Joined the Pride in 2018. Didn't play this year, obviously, because they were withdrawn from the Challenge Cup. Uh, in that tournament, she made three appearances in the fall series, returning three months after giving birth to her second child. So LaRue will be a big part of the Orlando Pride for the next three years. Does that mean Dom Dwyer signs back to Orlando and becomes a backup? Because I don't see him coming back in as a starter. They have Mateos Ayas. They have Tesho Akindeli. They are expected, unless this purchase option of whatever X amount of dollars is triggered. They will have Daryl DK coming back in the summer. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Tigres has equalized. I tried to hold the spoiler as long as I could there. As did I. They have they have equalized. It is 1-1. One, one. And uh, if you're looking for some fun this morning, uh, Wilson Hyundai and Tigres is looking like they might fit the bill. They're going to pull out the good drugs. Club World Cup will get that sometimes, especially in this mm-hmm. round where you're getting the, the CONCACAF and in either Asian or African qualifiers. You can get some really interesting matchups with teams that just don't know each other very well. And sometimes, you know, I mean, look, neither one of these teams would be expected to beat Palmeiras or, or to, to beat Bayern. So you kind of let it all Palmeiras lose. going to come out and play, actually? Uh, probably not, but they won doing that against Santos, so they could probably do it again. Um, it's not a fellow Brazilian team, so maybe they don't kick people as much as they did against Santos. I kind of wondered last night in the CONCACAF League final if we would see a lot of kicking of one another, and uh, it was a really good match with Alawalenze and Saprisa, who play again on Sunday in the league, yep. which they might really kick each other a lot in that yes. one. Uh, yeah. Saprisa took the early lead, and Alawalenze came back and won 3-2, right? Yep. Uh, 351st career all-time matchup between these two clubs in various competitions. Uh, 1-0, 1-1, and then it was two goals from uh, Alawalenze in three. Sorry. 
Sorry, John. We got a tweet from Paul Tenoria of The Athletic reporting with Sam Stej call. Sides still working on deal. Some sources expect it to get done. And other cautions, there's still a big gap to close before 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. If CBA is extended through 2027, which was the players or the, the league proposal, expect givebacks to players in free agency, which is something that has been proposed, and an increase in money in cap between 26 and 27, which I think was originally in the league proposal, but we don't know to what degree exactly. I'm right. guessing maybe there would be a bigger bump to 27 if you do that, which again playing the logical card, which you'd like to see in these meetings, makes a lot of sense. This is give and take. 50 to 70 million is your is what you're trying to get to one way or another. Okay, the league feels like they get there with this. The players don't want to give that much. If they get to two years, you got to spend more for the players in 27 before you can renegotiate. That's a no-brainer. you got to give on free agency, which I think is a should happen anyway. I don't have any problem with that. I think that's easy. I think the player, the league should have done that anyway. We should be further along. Okay. So, so sides are still working on a deal. Some sources expected to get done. And other cautions are still a big gap. Jeff Carlisle said there was a big gap. This is how the day is going to go. Yes. Put the coffee on. Make sure you order some more. Go ahead and plan on drinking all the Red Bull you need. Maybe you need to go get into Scott Brown's stash. I don't know. <laughs> It's not going to be fun. Or drink something better than coffee and actually respect yourself. There's that. Watermelon Red Bull. <laughs> sure. That's what I recommend. I prefer the peach. Still. Well, I actually have um, I actually have something I'm going to try. Maybe it's the right day for it. I, I, I bought it. I haven't had it yet. Uh, have you seen the Coca-Cola with coffee? Yeah, I've heard about this. Yes. Oh, God, no. I know. No. I'm, I'm, I don't know how to feel about it, but I'm going to try it. Um, and I might need to today. It, there, I got a caramel flavored and a vanilla flavored. Um, I I don't know what I've gotten myself into. Um, Probably disappointment. But well, yeah. DK says like, he just I'm finished the vanilla. The van- one. I'm leaning toward the vanilla version as opposed to the. I like caramel. I, I'm a big caramel fan. Uh, DK says he just finished the vanilla one and not a fan. So okay. that's that. That upsets me. I will probably go caramel first then DK. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, disgusting, Ricky says. Oh, well, God. I don't know if Ricky's had it. So, um, Ricky, are you uh, are you a valued source here? Can we trust you? Uh, Steve is yelling at me. Um, DK says it's strange. Oh, man, this is not going to be good. Yes, Kef, see, yes, you probably still can clean under your car hood with it. That is accurate. Yes. Domer see, says, I... though, and I did not know this, Mexican Coke with two shots of espresso with a drop of real vanilla is delicious. Wow. That sounds pretty good. The perfect Tommy. Co- Coke and coffee is a, a glorious treat. Wow, this is all over the place. This is like the MLS CBA negotiations. Yes, no kidding. Yeah, some folks sit there and say it's sunny. Some folks sit there and say it's, it's, it's cloudy. Some folks say it's raining. Some folks say it's not. It's like dealing with weather forecasts on a normal basis. Uh, Jarrett Ragamuffin says if, if you were coffee, you would be the lukewarm pot in the Sitgo in Athens. I'm insulted just because you think I'd be in Athens. I'd be like hey. the one outside of Bainbridge. Hey, man. Why you got to take like, a shot at Athens? You, you can not like Georgia all you want, but Athens be, is a great town. So you'd be you'd be in the convenience store in Quitman, Jarrett, is what you're saying? Yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> John, I'd be, I'd, I'd be the pot of coffee in, in the lukewarm, miserable pot of coffee in the small sitgo where you get a po' boy. There you go. Wow. See, Perfect Tommy see, says he's marinating a skirt steak in Coke and coffee right now. Interesting. Wow. See, see, I despise coffee with every fiber of my soul. I, do I, learned so, how to, I, mean, I learned how to make it when I was working overnight shifts for other people, but I will not touch it myself. Yeah, I can't drink coffee. I'm not a coffee person. That's why no. That's why we have what we have here in the office. For those watching on the Twitch pitch, there's your rather large... Are they sponsoring the show yet? They need no, to. no, we're not having any anything Pepsi-related sponsor the show. Sorry, I'm an Atlanta guy. I have standards. <laughs> uh, I, thought Mountain, I thought Mountain Dew was was, uh, was well, an associate. No, it's, with Pepsi. it's very Pepsi. No, it's it very. Oh, Pepsi. I thought it was. I thought it was off shot. Okay. No, mind. Dr Pepper's the one that that's, that's the wild what I'm card. Of, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the big wild card. I mean, there's plenty of other wild cards like RC and, and all the others, but yeah. Dr Pepper. Check. Yes. <laughs> well, that's just a whole other 
category that we're that's not going just, down. That that's is, you want to talk about something that's going to destroy your teeth instantaneously? <laughs> that's all gross. Um, and yes, the old Win Dixie. Win Dixie Brent. I agree yeah. with Jason Nix. Uh, lukewarm or room temp soda is still bad. Yes, it absolutely is. And and Domer, oh, you're, you are correct. No one slanders Dr Pepper. It is it is glorious. There, we got but, Dr Pepper uh, with cream soda these days. Yes, it's okay. Uh, the Dr Pepper be with, better. I like just Dr Pepper. Uh, I, the Dr Pepper with cherry uh, is okay because it's just kind of accentuating what's already there. It's all right. Yeah, I like it with cream soda. It should be better, but I still like it. Yeah. I've got to go just IBC or Stewart's for cream soda. No. I can't. I can't do any of the others. Yeah, this is what happens when there's an MLS CBA that's driving us crazy. We start Turns talking into about soft drinks sodas and coffee, and yeah, it's, uh, it's I don't. Know, I, I know uh, red hair. Uh, red hair makes good root beer. If you yes, for they do. DNA. And there's also an outfit in uh, I think New Creations out in uh, uh, Athens or Watkinsville. They do it too. They do a good. <laughs> uh, they do a good root beer. Interesting. Uh, but no, to answer your question quickly, uh, two goals in three minutes, down 2-1 on the Walense. Alberto Roman scores his first goal for the in, uh, first team playoff, a great uh, pre-kick. And then uh, Lopez scores on a rocket three minutes later. Ala Walense up 3-1. Angulo scores in the 87th to make it 3-2. And Ala Walense wins at home 3-2 to win CONCACAF League. There you go. There's your very short Conca Cinco from... Conca Uno. Basically, yes. Um, okay. Other stuff on the board. Uh, Jared, I'm assuming we've got you till about 10 o'clock, correct? Or not? Yeah, that's fair. We might have just lost Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you can stay as long as you like. Uh, I just, I I don't know what your schedule is. Probably another 10 minutes, call that. Fair enough. In time for the Apolinsky read. There you go. We're we're in extra time. Fair enough. I'll leave before the read so I can watch the Twitch scores rolled in. That, that actually does mean something to me. (laughs) <laughs> not even going to touch that one. Um, one thing to keep an eye on as we get closer to Champions League and Europa League coming back, and this is starting to bubble up in the news. You've got some interesting situations with travel that are about to emerge. Uh, Sky Germany reported that RB Leipzig has to tell UEFA by doing the math Monday if the home game versus Liverpool can be played. Now, why? There is a German travel ban from the mutation areas with COVID. The UK is one of those. If RB Leipzig cannot play the game at home, if they cannot allow, if it is not allowed for Liverpool to come into the country, um, they could play it at a neutral ground where both teams could get to. Or if they can't host and they can't organize a neutral ground by Monday, it's a 3 0 win for Liverpool. Yep. This is going to come up. Like, it's just going to happen. Now, also on this front, as we get closer to games, UEFA has updated their guidance, and Simon Stone of the BBC had this. This is for Champions League and Europa League. If clubs have 13. A-list players available, including a goalkeeper, they're expected to play the match. Now, UEFA does reserve the right, and I think this is kind of strange, if the match can't be played because of that situation, and maybe the travel one, but that's not the sense that we're getting from it. This is all very difficult to follow because it's coming from a million different places. If you don't have enough players eligible to play because of COVID situations, UEFA can change it instead of a two-legged tie to one. So you could change it because of that, but you're not going to change it because of a team not being allowed to travel in. There doesn't feel like there's any consistency here. And UEFA's got to make these decisions like starting Monday on these. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be very weird because you're going to have somebody who can't travel. You're going to have somebody who is missing a bunch of players with positive tests. It will happen. Uh, you had it in the Club World Cup. You had um, uh, the, the New Zealand club that could not play. They Auckland. couldn't travel. Auckland, they couldn't travel. So they didn't get a chance to play. They had to pull them out of the tournament. You're going to see somebody not play their Champions League or Europa League tie. I, just, I, I think it'll happen. Um, and also... Before we get to an update on the Club World Cup match, uh, right before halftime, Ajax kind of screwed up some paperwork 
Sebastian Haller, who they signed recently, was accidentally left off the Europa League list. <laughs> they didn't check the box. And uh, Eric Ten Hag, the manager, and Mark Overmars, the sporting director, both said, yeah, we, oops, our bad. Uh, we'll take the blame. They didn't want to say who did it, but ultimately they oversee it. You had to submit your final squads, 25 players. He wasn't included. Um, it was a mistake. And there's nothing they can do. They can't fix it. He can't play in the Europa League. Good job, Ajax. As Tigres yeah. takes a 2-1 lead going into halftime. Yep. Gignac uh, with the penalty. Yep. Uh, it was a handball. Went to VAR. And so Gignac puts it in. So it's 2-1 at the break. But uh, apparently also Ajax did remember to include midfielder Usama Idrisi, who is a deadline day loan signing, who has yet to play. But you left Holler off the list. Well, John, the deadline was Monday. Have they played since then? You put the dude, I don't know, but if you put on the dude that's not, that because it was a mistake. Because they made a mistake. Like, they didn't didn't put the guy on who hasn't played because he just joined the team instead of him. They didn't make a decision like that. They made a mistake. They didn't check the box. It has nothing to do with the other guy. But how do you, it's, it's, you spend 20 million pounds on Sebastian Holler. How do you leave him off the list? You forgot to check the box. It has nothing to do with leaving him off the list. You forgot to check the box. It's it's a clerical error. You're trying to make it like a football error. So, no, it's a clerical error. That's what Eric Ten Hag said. They didn't say, oh, yeah, we spent this money in this guy. Ah, we might not need him. It's okay. It happens. I've seen it happen in the U.S. Open Cup. Like, you have roster restrictions and when you have to submit rosters. And... You had complications you with had the restrictions. five international. Well, no, you had the the you had restrictions on that, but you have to send in a roster at a certain date, and yeah. I, I I can tell you exactly from experience because we had a situation with Atlanta FC when we qualified for the Open Cup in two thousand nine, and I'm sure the rules have changed a little bit in this, but not in in this sense because you have to submit a roster just like this. You submit a, a game roster. I think it was 48 hours before the game at that time. Well, the game was on a Tuesday. We had a game on Sunday, and a, a domestic game, a local game, and a player got hurt. He wasn't going to be able to play. Couldn't take him off the roster. Couldn't replace him on the roster. You, you weren't allowed because of the deadlines. It happens. That's going to be my question. Yeah, it happens. Like you, you have these limits, and it just it happens. So you have to check and double check and triple check and quadruple check that, yeah, the roster's correct. And somebody screwed up, and then it wasn't checked properly. Yeah, I mean, Turner says, imagine the meltdown from the fan base if, if Joseph got left off the Open Cup oh. roster like this. It, it's, it's, it's a human error. That's just what it is. But it's Ooh. pretty crazy. Yes. Uh, uh, did you see who uh, who was responsible for the penalty that... Gave Tigris the lead. Thank you. It was Kim Kihi, formerly of the Seattle Sounders. <laughs> Wasn't it, though? It was. Small world. So, so he's yeah. two-thirds of the way to a hat trick, so he scores the goal for Olsan. He gets the he gets the penalty awarded the other way. No, you don't get hat tricks for positive and negative. You either get a positive hat trick or a negative hat trick. Well, no, wait. I want to see where this is going. What's the third leg of the hat trick? That's what I'm trying to I'd be my this guess, is... yeah. No, what or is it, John? Goal? You're creating your own like hybrid hat trick. What do you have to do to, to complete the John Nelson hat trick? So if we've had a good own goal, well, yeah, because if but if, that's if, if you had negative. a good and a bad, then what's the ugly? The ugly would be an OG, wouldn't it? This is your game. I don't know. You tell us. I think the ugly would have to be an OG. Okay. Then if he has an OG, then he gets the uh, official John Nelson hat trick. The GBU hat trick. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Which nobody wants. Nobody wants that. Very bad. Um, Tigres lead 2-1 at the break. Zignac with both of them. So I wonder what the odds are on a Zignac hat trick. That's interesting. Mm. Um, don't know. Okay, we'll get into the games around Europe after this and any other updates that come up in hour number two. But some more domestic stuff before we wrap. Uh, NISA has announced their plans, Division Three Professional League alongside USL League One, uh, what they're going to do this year because you know they're, they're trying to figure it out like everybody else. They're going to do a tournament in Chattanooga at Finley Stadium um, in April. 
that'll run over the course of about two weeks. And everybody that is participating this season will be part of that. The New York Cosmos have announced that they are not going to play this year in NISA. Their future is very murky. Uh, But NISA will be playing in Chattanooga for two weeks. Then they will have a season, a kind of short season, through the summer and then have a championship. Uh, BN Sports, according to Protagonist Soccer, which is a, a great source for the lower divisions and grassroots side of the game, um, non-league kind of stuff. They have heard that from a NISA official that BN Sports will be broadcasting the spring championship match from Chattanooga. Uh, BN broadcast some of the fall series for them on, I think it was on the BN Sports Extra channel, the one that is over the air in some markets and available for free on a lot of different places. It is included in Fanatis. So you can get it outside of Fanatis. Uh, but it's nice to just have all the BN stuff in one place. Uh, you can get it through Pluto TV for free, and I want to say it's on Fubo for free and a bunch of other places. It's easy to get. So we'll keep you posted on that. Um, a team that will not be there yet is Chicago. They are joining the league next year. And C.J. Brown, who spent his whole career with the Chicago Fire, has coached as well with Chicago, with Real Salt Lake, with, the, with uh, New York City, with Orlando, with the Red Bulls. He will be the head coach and technical director of the new team. Uh, they're going to play at Seat Geek Stadium, former home of the, the Chicago Fire in Bridgeview. All coming together pretty nicely for uh, NISA in Chicago. Yeah, the uh, announcement for Seat Geek was last week, I think. And so now that you're bringing in uh, CJ, who's going to be both head coach and technical director, pieces are, are coming together for uh, NISA Chicago. A good, it's, it's a good move. It's a smart one because he's got a lot of name value in Chicago. Uh, Nazmi Al-Badawi has been the first player to sign with North Carolina FC now that they are in USL League One. It's his seventh season with the club. Makes total sense. Uh, I think a lot of people expected that they would just only play young players in League One. No, you've got some players with name value in the market. al is one of them. You know, He's a guy that can transition into working with the club past his time on the field. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, college games have gotten underway, and I know Turner has been involved with games at Lander. Uh, Division One games, you had 19 games scheduled yesterday. 15 of them went off across men's and women's D1. Three were canceled or postponed due to COVID-related issues. One was canceled because of bad weather. Uh, one was moved inside, which I do not know the Louisville Slugger Sports Complex Slugger Dome um, it's either at, I guess it's at Bradley. It could be at Eastern Illinois, but I think it's at Bradley. It's an indoor facility for baseball and softball, and Bradley in Eastern Illinois played there. Nice to have uh, that, that Slugger Dome. Yeah, I, I did not know that. Uh, I mean, obviously, when you're having to do with stuff in Peoria, then you're going to need facilities like this. But it, um, when I think of when you said Louisville Slugger Dome, I was instantly thinking or Slugger Dome. I was thinking Louisville, and I'm like, why are Bradley and Eastern Illinois playing in Louisville? But uh, it was a brand name. It was not a location, so that was yes. That was where I was trying to get my head around. They make it. bats. Yes, they do. They've made them for a long time. They're pretty good at it. I think that's what I hear. They've <laughs> had their moments. All right, Jarrett. Before you go, you have to uh, give John some advice on his upcoming read. That might be the best advice. Yeah. Really pretty good advice i think so yeah it was it was fantastic advice well i'm sure i'm searching for uh prop bets on genia getting a hat trick and i haven't seen one yet we will see if jared's silent advice silent advice why do you do that weird thing that's so strange uh i think you've already messed up your flow but here we go everybody's ready uh tell us about steve apolinski Apoletsky and Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network for wrongful death and serious injury matters. There's only one communication that you need to make with only one firm. Do you need to have this conversation? And it's Apoletsky and Associates, LLC. How do you have this conversation, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you. A couple different ways. You can get a free consultation by giving them a call, 404-377-9191, or you can reach out to Steve himself. Shoot him an email, steve at aa-legal.com. Send him your questions that way. Or you can go straight to the website, large device or small, 
Type in aa-legal.com, hit the enter key, the return key, the arrow key, whatever advances it forward to a home page. And the home page of Apolinsky & Associates LLC, once it shows up, a pop-up window pops up because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Thank you, Chris Hutchison. You can get your questions answered by the individual or individuals at the other end of said pop-up window. Four, any questions that you have, this is a firm that has over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Georgia and Alabama, recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine, being one of the top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia. For wrongful death and serious injury matters, only one communication that you need to make, email, web, phone. Zapolinsky & Associates, LLC, and the website is aa-legal.com. Just a little longer than normal. So I was, I was waiting for that baseline to kind of work my way. You always it. use that as an excuse. I do. It's 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 become a crutch. Okay, eight point seven. Well done from uh, wow. from Steve. Uh, eight point five. Solid. Um, eight point five. Uh, decent pacing. About nailed the ending. Point off for pin wag. See, the pen wag gets, uh, You're gonna lose more gets points both the sides of the equation here. Some folks like the emphasis of the pen wag. Others don't. Uh, just kind of off today, 6.5. Oh, really? Um, huh, that was good, with a question mark. Uh, 8.3. <laughs> that was good? Thomas Malthus out of 10. Ramada flow, depends on how you feel about that agriculture. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ricky did not pay attention because Fox did not do anything for halftime and they re-racked the 2018 MLS Cup highlights. They're good at that. And I'm sure I wasn't paying attention that they re-racked the El Trafico from 2018. Oh, come on. I've seen that highlight 543 times in the last few months. Yeah, I, uh, still guess, I still can't guess what happens when they shut that highlight. It's just, just, a- just please, just please do something different. Like, make a highlight package from the CONCACAF Champions League? Like, I don't care. Even do the Peacock thing where you just put a slate up? Like, it doesn't matter. Just don't keep re-racking three-year-old highlights. Man, craziness. Uh, Sean, minus one, flying start. Minus one, too fast. Minus one, email, web, phone, going with a 5.5. Okay. Uh, Patrick thought you passed out there for a moment. Uh, maybe it's my, maybe it was the hamsters in the internet that caused me to pause on the Twitch pitch. Uh, Thomas Jewin with a, a good question. Now sure. I'm confused by the quote only one communication unquote line with three yeah. methods. How do True. I make one communication through all three? That's the thing is that you can pick your method of communication. That's the beauty of the whole thing. But that's not only one communication. I think you need to work on your uh, script there. Let me see if I can find my script. Yeah. Minus two for fighting back about the pin wagon. It was coming. Uh, 7.1. Not noticeably bad. 8.125. Ah, so not noticeably bad gives me a what? 8.125. Okay. So I, I kind of wobbled on the landing, basically. Yes. Uh, okay. 10. Honestly, best read yet. What? Uh, now you're fighting about a good score? Like, no, who, who said that? Five takes. Well, thank you, five takes. Uh, an eight, Ragamuffin doesn't know. An eight, just throwing a number out randomly. <laughs> Random numbers. Uh, Chiefs coach Steve says five takes is handing out field day ribbons. I think that might be accurate. Um, Mateo gives me a five, by the way. Mateo's harsh. M- Mateo keeps us uh, on our toes, and, and he's definitely harsh when it comes to the read. And that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Domer makes a good point that you can use Hootsuite to spread your one attempt at communication over all three. But John didn't say that, and I don't think he even knows what a Hootsuite is. That is correct. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, All right. Thank you, Steve Apolinsky, for supporting the show. Thank you, Steve Apolinsky. Thank you, John, for entertaining us uh, so much with, with the reads. Let's get caught up on what is going on in Europe. Um, We'll start in England, and we'll work our way over to Spain and some other places. But what's going on, Liverpool? Like, why can't you score a goal at Anfield? They've lost back-to-back Premier League home games for the first time since September of 2012. 
They failed to score in three home league games in a row for the first time since October of 1984. That's a long time. 84. Long time. Some of you weren't alive yet. A long time. The shorts were very short at that time. They haven't done this since October of 1984. I said some of you, Domer. I was seven years old. 348 um, minutes now it's a long that time. Liverpool hasn't scored at home. It's a long time. And only one attempt on target. The fewest in a home Premier League game since April of 2017. Like, we're, we're reaching back into the record books to try to explain this. Uh-huh. Liverpool's got seven points out of six games, as well as losing in the FA Cup since the beginning of the year. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, for me, the team looked, and it's long ago since we looked like this, but we looked fatigued, mentally fatigued. That leads to not the best legs as well. It was a tough week, and today we were not fresh enough, and that means then not good enough to break the formation of Brighton. We played against a really good opposition. For us, this week looked too tough. We were not fresh. We were not mentally fresh. Uh, They have a good plan, and they deserve to win, but of course we wanted to play better and more convincing than we did tonight. They looked bad. And uh, I've, I've seen some, I think, valid speculation on this. You haven't been able to rest your outside backs, which are so important to this team. You haven't been able to rest them because you've had a rotating cast of characters at center back, and you've wanted to keep some continuity, and then that does make sense. But it's hurting you now because that is the source of your creativity. That's where your chances come from, and clank. Mm-hmm. Massive, complete, clank. Yeah. Uh, I'll ask you quickly, John, is Liverpool still a title contender now? They have to. It is a must win this weekend against Manchester City. Andy Robertson said after the match uh, yesterday that they are not in the title race. I think that if they win Manchester against Manchester City on the weekend, they're back in it. As of right now, no. As of right now, yes, because if they win on the weekend, they are four points back, uh, no matter what Manchester United does. Um, right. So, yes, they are now because they have that game with City. If they lose it and they are ten points back and City has a game in hand, yeah, they're done. Yeah, You fall double digits this far back, yeah, they're not winning the, the league. Then everything goes to Champions League for them. Mm-hmm. Um, if they win on the weekend, then they're absolutely part of the title race. Yep. Yeah, I, I think you're getting into that. You go double digits down, you're, you're done. And you're getting close to that point. Um, Everton is one that has a game in hand on City. They have two games in hand on, on Manchester United, Leicester, Liverpool, West Ham ahead of them. They are 11 points back, but with that game in hand, they've got that wiggle room. They still are alive in it. And yes, Everton, you can actually think you're alive in this thing. Believe in yourselves good win for them. That was a fun game with Leeds. Um, that was a really fun game to watch if you were a neutral. But they're the last ones that are are in it at the moment. West Ham is clinging. Everton is clinging. Liverpool could be done with it if they lose to City. And it could be a three-horse race with Manchester City, Manchester United, and Leicester. Um, I, I don't think there's a magic formula here. To be honest, for Liverpool, I think they are in a bad way. And You've got to have something special on the weekend because you're playing a team in City that has 13 wins in a row, 20 unbeaten, 2-0 win over Burnley. Um, They got an early lead, and it just looked comfortable from there. Pep said uh, when he was asked if there was room for improvement, a lot. Today we lost some simple balls. That's the only thing I'm concerned about. You you had a lead. You just got comfortable. He took the foot off the gas. Yeah, it showed. Uh, They can't do that against Liverpool for sure. I think they're easily the favorite. We'll talk about the the numbers as we get closer to it because things will change a little bit. But they're easily a favorite here, and they can knock a team out of the race. West Ham so, had a good... Oh, go ahead. I was just going to talk about XG with Manchester City. Oh, okay. The worst 15 single-game performances this season in the Premier League. Manchester City is responsible for six of them. Defensively. Point, hold on, hold yeah. on. 
Their defense is responsible. Yes. Okay, because yes. I don't want, we don't want people to think that they're scoring a bunch of goals that they shouldn't be. Yeah. So Manchester City, point oh five by Burnley in a loss. Point oh five by Crystal Palace in a loss. Point one five by Sheffield United in a loss. Point one eight by Brighton in a loss. Point two by Newcastle in a loss. Point two one by West Brom in a loss. So, and uh, other numbers. Uh, City's first in XG per game, XG conceded per match. Ederson's 13 clean sheets equal to City's total 13 goals conceded through 21 matches, eight fewer than anyone else. More than half of those goals came in the first three matches of the season. More than a third came in week two versus Leicester City. They lead the Prem in possession, passing percentage, shots per game, shots conceded. City's only conceded one goal in the Champions League in the group stage. And of the top 20 players in passes per 90 minutes this season, City has six, three in the top five. Not bad. They're, That's not bad. They're pretty good. Pep Guardiola kind of knows what he's doing. He, he's, he's rather experienced. Um, they're in the driver's seat here. I mean, they're going to have to slip up, I, I think, for United or Leicester to catch them. Uh, but they can put Liverpool away with a win on the weekend. If they lose that one, then it's going to get really weird. Uh, West Ham is still hanging around. Jesse Lingard goes there. He gets two goals in his debut with them. Pretty cool way to debut against Villa. Uh, West Ham is now in fifth place on 38 points. Uh, 11 wins, six losses, five draws on the year. Uh, they have a plus six goal differential won four of their last five. And, and yeah, David Moyes' side, still in it. And he's saying that Jesse Lingard should be part of England's squad this summer for the European Championships if he keeps playing the way that he is and he's not completely match fit. Uh, the game today could be very interesting. Tottenham and Chelsea. No Harry Kane for Tottenham. Uh, both teams really need points. Chelsea is in eighth. Tottenham is in seventh. Tottenham has a game in hand. They're both on 33 points. <sighs> uh, Thomas Tuchel is looking for a second straight and third straight clean sheet uh, since taking the or second straight win and third straight clean sheet since taking over the team from Frank Lampard. Uh, Christian Pulisic talked about this a little bit, and this is something to watch for with Chelsea today. He said he's playing in a different role. Uh, he's familiar with Tuchel's 3-4-3 that he wants to play. And think back to the way Atlanta United played in the 3-4-3 under Frank DeBoer at the beginning of 2020 before Joseph's injury. What it does is it allows the wing backs to attack out of the midfield. The wide players in that four, their wing backs, they can drop in and be you know fourth and fifth defenders when you need to. It allows them to stretch the field wide. The wingers, the, the wide players in attack tuck in. Remember, we saw Pitti Martinez, Ezekiel Barco, tuck in and play more as almost number 10s. Uh, Pulisic described the role as, quote, kind of false striker. So it, it's you're part of the forward line, you're, you're working with your fellow false striker and your striker, but you're not coming from a wide position, and it's kind of hard to pick that player up. He said he likes that, that role because it allows him to get in good attacking positions. He likes it a little bit more than playing wide in a 4-2-3-1 in a traditional winger kind of role. Um, one player who is seemingly thriving in this, this scenario with Thomas Tuchel is Callum Hudson-Odoi. Two games with Tuchel. Hudson-Odoi, 20 passes into the box, leads the team. 12 open play crosses, leads the team. 10 touches in the opposition box leads a team. Six chances created in these two games leads a team. Four shots leads a team. 0.57 expected assists leads a team. That's the effect you're seeing from Tuchel already with Chelsea. So 3-4-3, think back to the way Atlanta played in that 3-4-3. Yeah, Frank wasn't a complete idiot like some people tried to portray him as. That system could have worked for Atlanta. It didn't work without Joseph. Does everybody stay healthy so it can work for Chelsea? I'm, I'm excited to see it. And I like Pulisic in that kind of role. He played it for Tuchel at Dortmund. He knows what he wants. I'm excited to see what that one can be. On the Tottenham side, Jose Mourinho 
mind games because that's what he does, right? <laughs> no. He said, I don't think it's very difficult to coach at Chelsea because I was champion three times. Ancelotti was champion. Antonio Conte was champion. It cannot be very, very difficult because we win titles there. Already putting the pressure. Already putting the pressure. Oh, welcome to the Prem. Here's um, your numbers, by the hold way. Hold on. Hold on a second. England snob. Welcome oh, like to the Jose pre- Mourinho is no, 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 I'm, uh, no, I'm not going to let you get away with that one because you just pulled what? a total England snob on Thomas Tuchel. No, I'm, it's, yes, you, you know, did. Every single time Jose Mourinho has the opportunity to twist it a little bit. That's not what I'm talking he's gonna about. He's going to do it every single time, regardless of who the manager is. It just happens that it's Thomas Tuchel's You didn't say welcome to Jose Mourinho. You said welcome to the prim like Thomas Tuchel hasn't dealt with pressure before. No, it's every single time Jose Mourinho has a chance to kind of mm-hmm. sit there and tweak the opposition, mm-hmm. regardless of who it is, he's going to do it. It just so happens mm-hmm. it's Thomas Tuchel's turn. But welcome to the Prem. Welcome to the Prem. Welcome nobody to the else Marino. does that. Finger bomb. Goo, yay. I mean, come <laughs> on. Come on. Oh, like, he wouldn't, that, like Jose Mourinho wouldn't relish the chance to do no, this. No, it's nothing team. about Jose Mourinho. I'm saying Jose Mourinho's coached in other places. This is not a Prem thing. The Prim isn't the only one that has trash talking. We've even gotten into the telenovela in Spain yet. So the Prim is not some special place where you have trash talking and nobody else has it. It's not. Uh, Jose not- Mourinho will talk trash in any league in the world. Fine. You and my mother, when it comes to modifiers, my mother was an English major. She gets after me with all this stuff. It's very important because you put it on the Prim, and it's not the Prim. It's Jose. Jose did this at Real Madrid. He did it to Pep to the point that Pep cracked and cursed in a press conference. Pep didn't curse in press conferences. Jose got him to do that because he was irate. Hmm. It's, it's important. So don't give the Prim too much credit here. Just saying. We fight right. against the Prim uh, superiority complex. All right, so here's your juice boxes. Yes. Uh, Tottenham is a plus 285. Chelsea is a plus 110, and your draw is a plus 236, courtesy of our friends in the Composited Odds portal. Hmm. Did we pick this one on soccer over there? Uh, let's see. That is completely uh, random choosing of games to pick, and I do not remember. No, we, we did this. not. Okay, good. Then we can go uh, completely clean here. It is at Tottenham, but they don't have Harry Kane. Uh, I think it is a Chelsea win. Yeah, I mean, you've seen without Harry Kane, it looks like everybody is trying to look at Yon Min Son and go, here, you do it. And they haven't been doing it, so I'm leaning towards Chelsea as a win here, too. Sorry, Spurs fans. Um, I think it is... Sorry, Katie. Jason Nick says 2-0 Chelsea. I, I kind of like that scoreline. I, I will uh, borrow it, Jason. Sorry, Katie. We apologize. Um, all right. Other stuff in England. Uh, we have more buffoonery and racist stupidity. And yes, we have to talk about it because it is absurd. Uh, Southampton is now involved in this, John. Yes. Uh, you'll remember that uh, Alexander Jankowitz got the red in the second minute in the 9 0 loss and kind of set everything in motion there. And now he has been getting racially abused on social media. Stop it, you morons. Quoting Southampton, they said that they can confirm and it's been identified a number of posts on social media directing racial abuse at our 19-year-old midfielder Alex Jankowitz following last night's result at Manchester United. The club is passing on all abusive messages to Hampshire police. Hope they're able to permanently remove those individuals from our football community. I hope they find them, and I hope that they do. Ban them. Ban them from tickets at the club. Ban them from attending games uh, on the road for your club. Uh, ban them, period. Because mm-hmm. you're racially abusing a 19-year-old who uh, made a mistake in a game. It happens. Um, it's ridiculous. You wouldn't have done that if it was a player of a different color who made that same mistake. Because you're a racist. Don't be a racist. Um you were given homework, and we've not talked about it yet, and we have a lot of other things to cover, so I'm going to ask you to say, really this, condense There's a lot it. dealing with it. I, I want you to give us the uh, five million foot the cl- view the cl- here. The Cliff's Notes version? Uh, even less than that. 
Um, right. I want the very quick outline of the Burnley situation so we know what to look at with this purchase that has now left the club in uh, worse trouble. Kind of, sort of, but not. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe so. Maybe it's yeah. on paper that they're in worse trouble. But yeah. Burnley is in a weird situation after being purchased by ALK Capital. There's a lot of questions here, and it'll be interesting to see how it moves forward. But the bottom line is, and this is basically trying to cram as much information to a small amount of time as possible, ALK Capital purchases 80-something percent of Burnley. It's about $200 million in value. But a lot of folks are wondering, really, how much did ALK Capital invest in buying the majority share of Burnley? It looks like that what they did is they got a 60 million pound loan from Michael Dell's holding company, gave that to the guys that they were buying out. And then it appears that they took cash on hand inside Burnley itself. And the guys that they were buying out were cool with that too, to get to the halfway point of the 200 million that they're investing. The question is now where is that extra hundred going to come from to cover the cost of the purchase? There are mechanisms in place that if they can't come up with the other hundred million, that the sale will revert back for a, a double positive there, basically a, from the Department of Redundancy Department. Everything will go back to the original owners. But the questions are couplefold here. With the $60 million that you're getting from Dell Holdings, obviously there's interest involved. Where are you going to get that interest payment from? And it's going to, they don't know the interest rate, but when Southampton did the same thing with Dell, the interest rate that Dell gave them was 9%. Standard interest rates in situations like this are about one to one and a half. So Dell is charging an incredible amount of money to give ALK the opportunity to put 60% of the money down to buy Burnley, it's about £6 million a year. Where, with Burnley, currently, are you going to find £6 million a year to simply pay the interest on a loan that was more for half than what you did when you tried to purchase what you were looking at? So that's Right the now big you're question. not, but when you get fans back in the building, can you, and can you make the player sales to help do that? Maybe. And so that, that's part of it. If, and uh, Pace and his fellow members at ALK think that their business model, which is akin to what the Glazers were doing at Manchester United, and they've raised a lot of debt, Uh, when it comes to Manchester United. They think that their model is sustainable whether Burnley stays in the Premier League or not. I find that to be interesting when you say that because your TV revenue dips by 96% on its own. But you've got parachute payments in the short term. Right. So there are some folks who are vandalized this. They sit there and say if they go to the championship, they don't know how it's sustainable. Pace Capital says, yes, our model is sustainable. Uh... And they're looking at analytics now when it comes to uh, player talent. And so that would be another way where they would bring players either in, work their analytics, sell them on for profit, reinvest, and so forth, or try to bring folks up from the U23s. Uh, Right now, when I looked at the U23s, they only have a couple of midfielders that right now, according to Transfer Market, are six-figure value. So uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff with uh, Burnley. And where they're going to come up with the extra hundred million, but it looks like sixty percent of uh, what they've spent already, basically thirty percent of what they did to buy Burnley came from a loan, and they took in-house money to get them to the halfway point. So there's still a lot of questions when it comes to Burnley and the new owners. I somehow have a uh, leaf blower that is at my window when it's not on the ground. I don't understand. See, there you go. I don't there understand how that's even possible, but it's it's impressive that it's so loud. Um, Olson Hyundai nearly equalized, but it was brought back for offside. And now you have a uh, Tigres player down inside the 18. You had a, uh, overhead kick that was saved. It's a kind of a wild second half in this match. Uh, still two, one Tigres at the moment. Uh, yeah, the leaf blowers are out of hand. Um, DM Tim, it's craziness. 
Uh, we do have this. Arthur Blank, owner of Atlanta United, is gifting $17 million to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Uh, This is from the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, uh, which oversees the Atlanta United Foundation and Falcons and and et cetera, et cetera. Five-year, $17 million grant. uh, The National Center for Civil and Human Rights is in downtown Atlanta. If you have not had a chance to go, I cannot recommend it enough an amazing facility uh some amazing people have led the the facility over the years doug shipman uh we had a chance to meet him he, he was one of the i think he was the founding ceo and did a lot of the prep work it, it's just an in, incredible facility and they do amazing work in the community so no surprise that arthur blank is is doing something like this he supported the facility many different ways for a long time but this just kicks it up a whole nother notch so uh, very, very cool. I think there's a media availability here in about an hour where there will be more about it. But uh, Arthur Blank, Atlanta United's owner, doing a, you know, amazing work in the community like he always does. So uh, great news on this. A $17 million gift over five years to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Oh, that's very, very cool. I thought we were heading to the other stuff in the EFL. Okay, John, we'll go to the other stuff in the EFL. My <laughs> bad. Uh, oh, no. Yay, let's get into the EFL. Woo! Yeah. Well, no, there's more stupidity. I thought that's where we were heading. Okay, give us but stupidity. You want stupidity? Sure. Okay. Non Lake Chesterfield accused of cue jumping and immoral behavior after several of their players and staff received uh, COVID uh, vaccines. Players as young as 21 at the National League Club, given the vaccine currently meant for folks who are over the age of 70. And this is according to uh, the second newspaper that we refer to over in England, not necessarily by name, but they do appear on a daily basis and sometimes in your mail. Uh, Medical staff at the club were not told about the plan and were said to be, quote, horrified, end quote, when they found out. Players and staff received leftover Pfizer vaccines at a medical center close to club headquarters after being called late in the day after scheduled patients didn't turn up. uh, NHS England guidance is that when vaccines shouldn't be wasted, they should be given to those in priority, those over 70, clinically uh, vulnerable and so and such. And so uh, the club is horrified. They've come out with public statements. And so uh, NHS has said that they're going to uh, investigate and it's unacceptable to jump the COVID vaccine queue. Yeah, not good. Not a good situation because I'm going to assume that uh, these folks are not doing any uh, caregiving activities either yeah. as you know, professional footballers um, or maybe semi-pro footballers might be the best way to put it in this case. Right. Uh, not a good look. Um, I think you had another EFL point you wanted to bring up. Well, it, I can actually uh, update. With the story that we just did, according to our friends at Sky, NHS staff at the vaccination center have received threatening calls after they vaccinated uh, some of the players from Chesterfield. So, stop being idiots, people. Yes, like sometimes people do stupid things, and they should be punished and criticized for doing stupid things. But don't yell at the people who are giving the vaccines because other people did something stupid. Yeah, stop. Come on, man. Yeah. Can we stop being idiots, please, in the world? Can we just try to do that in 2021, please? So, yeah. So that that was out at about 8 o'clock this morning. But the other news out of the championship, John Terry might be uh, in consideration for the full-time Bournemouth gig. And he's always uh, had the desire to be a head coach right now, uh, the uh, if he leaves from his assistantship at Aston Villa, Bournemouth feels pretty confident that they can uh, meet the compensation package that Villa would want. Uh, they fired Jason Tindall, sorry, sacked Jason Tindall after losing four in a row, and now they are Bournemouth. They are in the last spot in the promotion playoffs, two points ahead of Middlesbrough. But there are five teams separated by four points for that last spot from six to uh, six to tenth in the championship right now. He's got to get experience somewhere. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk like, oh, he'll go to Chelsea. That worked really well for Frank Lampard. Um, he hasn't managed yet. So, I mean, he's got to get the opportunity somewhere. I don't know, you know, what his philosophy is as a manager. I mean, Bournemouth has 
in the past, because they had continuity at the manager position that they have now lost, they had a philosophy. They had a way to play. They, they tried to do things a certain way. Is he going to fit into that, or are they rebooting it, or does he even have that yet? Or is he just going to assume somebody else's? Is he going to just try to fit into to what was there before? Or is he going to bring a new spin on it? Like, we don't know. I haven't really heard him talk about it. So I don't know what his, his thought process is about how to be a manager and how he wants his team to play. That's what I'd like to hear. Um, this feels like a big job. I mean, Patrick Sullivan says Boardman seems a bit high for him to start as a head coach. He's not getting it. I, I, I don't know. Like he, he could go in and be great because you've seen it happen before. He could go in and, and flop dramatically because you've seen that happen before. I just haven't really heard him say very much. Yeah. about the way he sees the game and what he would do. So let's see. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. It doesn't feel like a, a very sure move for Bournemouth. To yeah, Patrick Vieira is apparently no also on the short list. He's got more experience. Like, I mean, a safer move? That's obviously a safer move because he's been in league. He's been in MLS. He's got years of experience. You can say he's good, bad, or indifferent, but you have a track record to look at. You would know what to expect, I think, to a degree. With John Terry, it's a complete and utter unknown. And do you want to make that play if you're Bournemouth right now? I don't know if this is the time to try to pull that wild card out and see what you get. No, I mean, like you've lost your last four. You haven't won in your last five. You've, lost, you've won once in your last six. You were anywhere from second or third, and you've plummeted down to sixth. And like I said, you're in that last promotion playoff spot right now with a lot of folks breathing down your neck. So, you know, that's do you want to make that call on John Terry right now? Well, it sounds like they're considering it at least. Uh, let's go to Spain. You've got games today. You've got a game today. Uh, Real Betis and Athletic Bilbao. This is the quarterfinal of the Copa del Rey. Um You've got, so far, Sevilla, Levante, and Barcelona in the semifinals. We'll talk about how Barcelona got there in a minute. That game will be on ESPN Plus later today. But when we start to jump into Barcelona and Real Madrid, because both of them are, are full of the drama, you know, uh, uh, unlike John's earlier assertion that the Premier League was the only place where you had shenanigans and subterfuge and Oh, you want plot shenanigans and, and subterfuge and you can go straight to Barcelona. All of those things. We're we're going to La Liga and it's time for a new segment. Music seemed to be appropriate. It's not quite the theme to uh, Dos Mujeres Un Camino. Oh, But yes, it is time for the uh, Spanish telenovela of Barcelona and Real Madrid. So Barcelona yesterday was uh, in the midst of a major scare in the Copa del Rey semifinal at Granada. They needed goals to get to extra time. They were 2-0 down in the 88th minute. They got a couple goals uh, as the leaf blower still attacks me. They took it to extra time, and then Antoine Griezmann, Frankie De Jong, and Jordi Alba with an amazing goal uh, took it to a 5-3 win. It got to 3-3 in extra time because Federico equalized after a goal to give Barcelona the lead. Barca had 36 shots, 20 of them on target. I mean, it's not like they were being dramatically outplayed by Granada all day. Uh, Lionel Messi like accounted for 500 shots in this game somehow between himself and his teammates. It was absurd. Uh, but they win. They advance. They go to the semis. They are in it for a trophy in the Copa del Rey. Antoine Griezmann has really come on for Barcelona since the start of the year. He's been involved in 11 goals, six goals, five assists, more than any other La Liga player since the beginning of 2021. He had a goal and an assist in the last five minutes against Granada. He ended up with two goals and two assists on the day. He's putting the team on his back in a big way. Now, you still have the off the field side of things in Barcelona. You have Lionel Messi, who uh, this would be like when the, the big dramatic music would come in. Lionel Messi's going to great lengths to find out who was responsible for leaking the private information about his contract to El Mundo, Spanish newspaper. That came out on Sunday. 
Uh, RAC1, which is a Catalan radio channel. Messi's lawyers are looking to open a criminal investigation into the five figures who were entrusted with the full details of his contract. Joseph Bartomeu, former president, former vice president Jordi Mestre, current CEO Oscar Grau, current legal head Roman Gomez, Punti, and current president of the management commission Carlos Tusquets. Remember, they don't have a president at the moment. That election's coming up in March. So he wants to have a criminal investigation of these five individuals because Messi's lawyers believe they're the only ones who would have the ability to obtain all the info of the contract. It is not Oscar Grouch, Ragamuffin, uh, but maybe Messi's lawyers think he could be that. Um, they're the only ones who could have it. So they're opening a criminal proceeding against these five men, uh, believing that some or all of them were, quote, necessary collaborators in the leak. Bartomeu, before anybody said Bartomeu had anything to do with it, he came out and said, it wasn't me. Uh He he started singing the Shaggy song uh, from a few years ago and said it wasn't me. He who denied it supplied it. Yes, that's another way to put it. Um, That's from like the late 70s, right? Yes. That's what I thought. Uh, It is categorically false that I have leaked Messi's contract. He said in a text message sent to a Catalan football program, (laughs) Gol a Gol. This is a very serious issue, and it is totally illegal to filter professional contracts. Speaking on television and accusing is easy, but we are not joking, because this will end up in court. Yes, it will, Mm -hmm. Mr. Bartomeu. Um, Mestre has defended Messi against accusations that he financially ruined Barcelona. He said, Messi hasn't ruined Barca, and anyone who says so either has no idea or says so in bad faith. He is the former deputy sporting director. Um, Now he is in the crosshairs of this investigation. Also, because there's not just one bit of drama with Barcelona, there's always multiple uh, lanes of drama. Ronald Koeman said that the PSG talk about Lionel Messi is too much, and he branded Angel Di Maria's latest comments as disrespectful. Di Maria said after PSG's win yesterday, there's a big chance that Messi will make the move to Paris. Barca play PSG in a few weeks. Ronald Koeman uh, is not happy about these conversations being had publicly by PSG people. He said, for me, Di Maria has shown a lack of respect. It is not respectful to speak so much about someone who is still a Barca player. It's not good. It's a mistake to say something like that. It could add further spice to the Champions League game. No. It's not right. PSG talk about Leo too much. He plays for Barca, and in addition, we have a two-legged tie against them coming up. Coleman's right. I mean, it is it is disrespectful. I mean, it shouldn't be coming up. You're going to get asked about it, but just give the no comment. He's not our player, et cetera, et cetera. It's not tapping up, Ragamuffin. I think you know people throw tapping up as a term like if you just say something about it. Tapping up is actually negotiating a contract while somebody's under contract elsewhere. I think it goes beyond just Di Maria, who has no say in giving contracts, popping off at the mouth. Uh, Di Maria might be targeted by um, some players who maybe go in with very high tackles uh, to mm-hmm. kneecaps or something. That could happen. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's, it's kind of ugly. Um, also, because there's never just two lanes of traffic when it comes to <laughs> Barcelona, uh, Santi Ovalle on Twitter has said that according to sources close to Sergio Aguero, it is true that he would be happy to come and play for Barcelona to play alongside Lionel Messi. Presidential candidates have already made some contacts to Sergio Aguero's agent. He is out of contract in the summer as well. Do you keep Messi and add Aguero to that team? Is that the way you would keep that group together? Aguero and Messi are very, very good friends. Very, very close. So that's an interesting addition into all of this madness. Real Madrid saw all this going on, and they said, you know what, we want to get in on the craziness. So the latest on Madrid, first off, Eden Hazard has suffered his... The leaf blower is not taking out Eden Hazard. 720th injury. No, his ninth since arriving at Real Madrid. He's missed 43 games, and he's been out of the team due to injury almost a full calendar year. Man, this thing's ridiculous. Um, I thought they were almost done. One second. Keep revving it. There you go. Get it all done. Please, just hurry up. Injured a muscle in his left thigh following the day's training session. 
uh, which Spanish media said he was unable to complete. It's the latest in a string of injury setbacks. Remember they, that uh, they paid 90 million pounds to Chelsea with the possible rise of 130, so anywhere from 90 to 130 million pounds for Eden Hazard, who has been out for a calendar year. Belgian's Not quite national a team doctor, almost. 283 days. Christoph Sass has said the fitness situation is different with Azard. He told the Belgian publication Newsblatt, quote, We are awaiting the details and knowing more, but it is clear that it is worrisome. The injuries at this stage of the season are not worrisome for the Euros. It is even a rest period, but with Eden, it is different. It's another relapse, a chronic situation that always goes wrong in the end. First the ankle, then the muscle injuries. It's all very unpleasant. Eden is in a vicious circle. And it's not easy to get out of it. It's disturbing what happens with musculature. Well, I'm in a vicious circle of leaf blowers, but everybody's saying it's actually not that loud. So I will continue. Trust me, it's loud in here. I can promise you that much. Um, Real Madrid, they do not want Gareth Bale to come back. No. For multiple reasons. One is maybe his hair. Two is maybe he held up a flag that said Real Madrid was third behind golf in Wales. Uh Another reason is because he kind of didn't really do much for them and seemed like he didn't care. Uh, fourth would be the time when they were playing a match and somebody gave him the, the pendant for the team to hold in the team picture and he looked at it like it was disgusting. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of reasons. There's another one to add to it, which I did not consider. Uh, Great Britain, no longer part of the European Union, which means that if Gareth Bale comes back to Real Madrid, he takes up one of the non-EU spots. Mm. So it gets even more complicated. It's not just about pennants and flags and golf and other things. It's about roster spots. And awesome. Tottenham does not want to keep Gareth Bale after this loan expires. <laughs> They're like, no. nah, we're good. It's like, nah, we're good. Go, go, go on. Back. It's all good. Yes. Uh, another radio program in Spain uh, and our final bit of the telenovela update. El Larguero is reporting that Raul former uh, great striker for Real Madrid, is the main candidate to take over at Real Madrid at the end of the season. Max Allegri is also an option, but Raul is the clear favorite at the moment. Madrid did this with Zinedine Zidane, and it worked pretty well. He's won a whole bunch of trophies for them, um, but it's kind of time. Raul would be in the same situation. Not any managerial experience, club legend, he understands what the club is supposed to be, yada, yada, yada. But he's not going to come in with some dramatic tactical plan that we know of because he doesn't have any managerial experience. But that's the direction Real Madrid appears to be going. And barring, and even according to some sources in Spain, it uh, doesn't even matter if Zidane wins another Champions League. He's gone at the end of the year. But some say that if he wins Champions League, he could save his job. That's really where things stand with Zinedine Zidane in Spain at this point. Um, one other thing, and, and this is not a, a Spanish telenovela, but it would be an Italian telenovela, uh, Arturo Vidal. Not happy about being substituted in that 2-1 loss to Juventus. He said, it's always number 22. He wears number 22. Mm -hmm. uh, always 22. It's always number 22 that's being subbed. Um, he hasn't been very good. No. So, uh, yeah, it probably is always number 22 being subbed because you're not really doing the business there, Arturo Vidal. Uh, quick update, if you have not been watching the Club World Cup match, you know, a bunch of you in the Twitch pitch are. If you are not, you might want to turn it on. It's a good one. Tigres are 2-1 up over Olson Hyundai. Uh, the winner will go on to play Palmeiras, and it is in the 82nd minute on my clock. Yeah. Uh, just generally... Um, very intense here in the second half. A lot of flying tackles from Tigres as they start to defend deeper. Olsen Hyundai is throwing everything forward to look for an equalizer. Uh, very entertaining final 10 minutes or so on deck. It's on Fox Deportes and FS2. Uh, 12.30, it is uh, Aldo Hale and Alak Lee on the same networks that are playing it now. Uh, let's go down to South America with an update. You had the draw for the Copa de la Liga Profesional de Football in Argentina. It's not the Copa Diego Armando Maradona anymore because Maradona's family is in the midst of some pretty nasty uh, legal situations with 
his former lawyer and doctor, and the league was like, yeah, we're going to stay out of this. So it's the Copa de la Liga Profesional de Football. Um, 26 teams in the first division now in Argentina, with two being promoted, uh, Platense and Sarmiento. It's a 13-game season because it is being considered a league championship, not a cup championship. You'll find in some countries around the world, people get really bent out of shape about how many league titles, how many cup titles, and how many overall trophies. This is one. Argentina gets really severely, uh, maybe just detailed when it comes to what's a league title or not. This is going to be a league title with 13 games in a playoff. 12 games, you play the teams in your group once, and you play one Clasico, which some of them are not actually Clasicos because... Platense and Sarmiento, for example, not really a Clasico. Uh, River and Boca is a Super Clasico, and that yes. will be on March 14th, the fifth week of the competition. Two groups of 13. The top four from each group go to a knockout stage. Uh, group A winners play fourth in Group B, for example, in the bracket. It is a, a quarterfinal, semifinal, and a final. Uh, we've mentioned Independiente and their stuff. They have not made any payments that we know of. Um, Francisco Silva is the latest. They owe him 950000 I think our last update, they, we talked about them owing a club over a million dollars. Uh, FIFA's ruled on Silva. They've got 45 days to pay, or they're banned from the transfer market for the next three windows. It's around $6 million in the next three months that all told they owe to players and clubs to get out of these debts, and I don't know how that's going to happen. Uh, one other signing with an MLS uh, trigger in Argentina, Tomas Martinez, former designated player for the Houston Dynamo. He has joined the Copa Sudamericana holders, Defensa y Justicia. The uh, bump is you... real. What? The SDH bump is real. I'm not going to be running around putting that on my back just yet. I'm just happy Defensa y Justicia won a title, and B Nacional, who didn't want to respond to things, uh, has, has not. They've really kind of stunk it up. Um, Mm -hmm. That's all we're going to say. Tomas Martinez, though, I I like him as a player. It didn't really work for him at Houston, although I thought he was fine. It just didn't, he didn't have the impact that he needed. Uh, He's going to defense uh, in a lot, in a large way to replace Washington Camacho, whose loan is over with the club. They've got a bunch of players on loan. Most of them are through the end of the calendar year, but they've got some maneuvering to do. And and this is the next step for defense is, You've been able to win a South American title with a lot of loan players. Some of them you might keep, but most of them are going to go back to their clubs. Are you going to be able to actually grow from here to where you're not as quite reliant on uh, loans? Turner Kirby asks, what's the latest with Pitti, um, Pitti Martinez and his club and their wage situation? Haven't really heard. Like, that bubbled up quickly and then kind of faded. They won... Uh, a trophy in Saudi Arabia. I think it was like a Super Cup. Uh, it wasn't a major trophy. Um, he was involved in it, and uh, he was very happy to win the trophy, and we haven't heard anything else about next steps with that. So I don't know. Like, that was a really weird one. Like, is he actually owed a bunch of money? Was it a, a threat that, you know, hey, you're behind on your payments, you're going to make these up, and they did? Or was it an agent dropping news out there just to keep his name in the news? I don't know. I honestly don't know, Turner. Like, we haven't heard any updates at all on it, so... I don't know if he's going anywhere or not. Uh, River is potentially going to lose uh, Nacho Fernandez to Atletico Mineiro. It's a $6 million offer that is allegedly on the table. Remember, uh, Jorge Sampaoli is at Atletico Mineiro. Uh, Ignacio Fernandez has been maybe River's best player over the last couple of years. This is where some of these deals get complicated, and when you wonder why like the Moises Caicedo deal took so long and why some deals out of Argentina take longer, this is why. His player pass, River owns 75% of it. Gimnasia, his former club, owns 20%. The player himself owns 5%. Also, according to Teise, River owes Fernandez money. They're behind in his payments. So this money coming in, $6 million, they won't get all of it. Hymnasia will get 20% of it. The player himself will get 5% of it. River will pay Fernandez whatever they owe him, and then they'll pocket the rest. Don't know how much that will pocket. So when Jason Nix asks, do you think Pitti ends up back at River? Eventually, yes. Soon, no. 
because I don't think they can pay any kind of a transfer fee to get him. And it doesn't appear that he could walk because he's not being paid. It doesn't appear you're at that stage yet. So, yeah, I do think he goes back to River. It's very typical for big-name Argentines. And Pitti Martinez is absolutely a big-name Argentine player. It's very typical for them to start their career in Argentina. A lot of times go overseas or to other countries younger than Pitti did. But go to other countries... Um, then come back at the end of their career to Argentina and, and play a season or two or whatever. Uh, we saw that with Lisandro Lopez, for example, and, and he's kind of a rare one where he went back to Racing, did incredibly well, and now he's got a unique opportunity to finish his career elsewhere. Um, Racing's soap operas probably have a part to do with that as well. Yeah, it's not even my yard, Ragamuffin. Like it's, uh, there's not even that many leaves out there. I don't know what they're doing at this point. Uh, my apartment complex, they're going out of control with this stuff. Um, and they're just, they have to do it. They're just hanging around here. Like, go do that elsewhere. There's not that many leaves out there, guys. <laughs> Come on. So um, you've got, it's like you've got asphalt and a wall and kudzu. I mean, there's leaves in certain parts of the complex, but you were like over here by this window, and now you're over here by this window, and there's not that many leaves out there. I was just out there before the show started. It's absurdity. Man, I apologize. Yeah. Um, two other bits of news before we finish up with Twitter. Guillermo Barros Escaloto, remember him, LA Galaxy do. Maybe they're happy he's not there anymore. He could be back in management in Brazil in Sao Paulo, which means it might last only about three weeks. Um, that's the rumor out of ESPN Argentina. And you had a big game on Goal TV yesterday. If you have Goal TV or you have Fanatis, FNTZ.co slash soccer down here. The Clasico in Uruguay, Peñarol and Nacional. Last time I saw these two teams play, there was a whole bunch of fouls and no goals. This time, same thing. Whole bunch of fouls, no goals. Clasicos in Uruguay, you might want to skip. They like to kick each other a whole lot. Don't really like to score many goals. Uh, Nino Torres, who was calling a game in English, uh, I love his work. He, he calls games in Ecuador. He calls games from Portugal as well. Um, he was begging for goals throughout the whole call. It was hilarious. <laughs> he, he's just begging for somebody to score a goal. He did not get his wish. He was a, a very sad commentator at the end of the match. Uh, but Peñarol Nacional, no goals, 0-0. And Uruguay still has not determined who will be their uh, slots in Copa Libertadores because they haven't finished the competition yet. They're in the second phase now. Basically, you have different dates where they have to, to declare who it is. So the first dates are for the, the Uruguay four spots, the ones that go into the qualification process for Libertadores, not the group stage. The way this is going to play out, and this is bonkers, you get to, and I believe Monday is the first date after this weekend's round of play. The team that is in fourth, that would, if everything ended, would go. They're the ones who are no essentially nominated for that spot. They can say, nah, we think we're going to finish higher when the next date comes up, and we won't have to go into the first qualification round. We're going to wait it out. We say no. That doesn't rule them out of qualifying. It takes them out of the Uruguay 4 spot. So they can bet on themselves. <laughs> but if they don't qualify, then they miss out entirely. This is going to be a crazy game in Uruguay that they are doing with this. Um, I can't wait to see how it plays out. Because somebody will think, yeah, we can go on a run here in the next couple of games and improve our standing and go automatically into the group stage. Somebody's going to think that, and they're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And they're going to miss out on the Libertadores entirely. And I think they'd miss out on the Sudamericana as well. Somebody's going to do it. I can't wait to see who it is, because there will be madness in Uruguay when this happens. Breaking news sounder, please. From the FA, Jan Bednarik will be available for Southampton FC's next fixture after an independent regulatory commission upheld a claim of wrongful dismissal and removed his suspension. The defender was sent off for denying an obvious goal-scoring opportunity during a Premier League fixture against Manchester United on Tuesday. Is there any other explanation? Because there needs to be more. Just the, the two sentences from the FA. There needs to be more explanation because 
you are either saying, and they generally don't do this in, in England, um, referee got it wrong completely and utterly that it wasn't a foul, which is the way I would lean to, that it wasn't a foul. But you had a ref, you had a video assistant referee. Done. Um Oh, question real quick before we move on. I don't want to miss it. Uh, Perfect Tommy and Mataflo were discussing the Ecuadorian Super Cup. I believe the only way to watch that is through pay-per-view. And uh, the, one of the outlets was Fight TV, which does a lot of MMA. I think they do some uh, independent wrestling as well. I believe it is FITE.TV. They, yeah. they were linked as having the rights to it. And I think it was like 10 bucks a game. Um but I don't have the details on that. I don't think anybody else has picked those up that I know. I think Fight TV is the only place to get it that I've seen. Uh, we'll see what we can find out. Uh, it looks like the, the matches today and tomorrow have been postponed. I, I think it's really complicated because people don't exactly know what's going on. Uh, we need our uh, Nuestra Jefe de Football Equatoriano, uh, El Mataflo, to, to yes. fill us in here because... I'm a little confused by it as well. I've seen that games were postponed, but I think those might have actually been incorrect schedules. So I'm baffled. Uh, Mataflow, we're, we're putting out the Mataflow bat signal for an update yes. on the Super Cup. Yes. What else we have on the Twitters? As we'll, we'll see what we can find out, probably talk about it tomorrow, as to how uh, the FA and everybody ruled on this situation with Southampton. We got plenty. So okay, what do we got? Because we, we rambled and talked about a lot of things today. All right, so Nathan Pugh came in early this morning. He says, first off, happy MLS CBA deadline day. But that's not happy. At some point, you just got to go, we kind of stink. And this is his Liverpool rant for the day. Oh, Fuck okay. the upstarts. Uh, at some point, you just got to go, we kind of stink, and the injuries are just too much up the Reds. Addendum. Reds don't stink. They're just profligate and lost, damaged and wandering. With that, watch them beat City 3-1 on Sunday. Not seeing that happen, Nathan, but I like the positivity. KFC, set pieces, the players, and approach differs year to year and results vary. What do you think of when you think of Atlanta United dead ball situations? Joseph's PKs, craps from outside the box, short corners, no corners, or the promise of a defender meeting across? And what to, what do you expect in 2021? I don't know what to expect yet in 21 in terms of a philosophy on it. Um, no way to know yet. And I don't think it'll be a, a major priority very early on for Gabriel Heinze because you're going to be focused more on the run of play. Uh, Joseph taking penalties, he's fine. I have no problem with Joseph taking penalties. I trust him in those moments. He's been very, very good in them. Um, you don't you don't build your, your set-piece strategy around having somebody like Kevin Kratz was on, on these situations, like David Beckham was. Uh, like Lionel Messi is right now. Like, you know, when you have those guys, then, yeah, you're going to have a wider range uh, of set-piece opportunities that you'll go to goal with. Like, there's some things you do differently, but these are special players and special moments. You know, Kevin Kratz, like, when he came to Atlanta, he wasn't a player who was going to start every game. But when he was on the field on a set-piece opportunity, he had it because he was that good at it. Um, do you have somebody like that now? I don't think so. I think Barco's really good uh, on set pieces and, and free kicks, and he, he puts them on goal, and he puts them in dangerous situations. But short corners, I like short corners. Uh, a lot of people don't. I think in terms of being a team that you're trying to prevent transition and counterattacks on, short corners are a good way to do that because they allow you to continue to build up the play and do it a little bit differently, maybe a little bit safer. That's going to be the thing that I'll look for initially, will be what Atlanta does on these kinds of opportunities, whether it's a, a crossing free kick or a corner, to prevent the break. Because so we saw that hurt them at times in, in 2020. It's something that you have to figure out how to defend and have to be organized to defend. And you've got to have players back. You've got to be positioned properly. You can't have the situation where Heinemann was out of position, it breaks behind him, he can't get there. Um, you've got to have extra players, numerical superiority to defend when these situations happen. If the other team leaves three out, you've got to leave four. You know, stuff like that. So um, that's where it stands. Uh, I think we'll, we'll learn over time. I, from what I've read on, on Gabriel Heinze so far, I don't think there's any specific philosophy on it because most teams don't. Most managers don't. If you have a player who is great on them, he takes them. 
Uh, corners, you might lean more to short corners than than other corners, sure, but more personal preference, more about the players you have. You've got the materials to be good on these with Barco, with Miles Robinson. Um, Fernando Mays is good in the air. Franco Escobar is good in the air. You, you've got the materials to be a good team on set pieces, but you've got to get the run of play down the way you want first. That's going to be the priority. T. Grace Marsh- has won and advanced in the Club World Cup. Uh, great comeback for Tuca Ferretti's boys. Yes. Marshall Voigt and his Thursday thoughts. Uh, I don't know if y'all have seen the new Sports Nation show on ESPN+, Plus, but Taylor Twellman clearly does not like Atlanta sports and was bashing on Trey Young. But today's episode did have some good Barca talk. It's not bashing on Trey Young, people. Y- y'all don't even know how special Trey Young is, man. Like, he's unique. He's doing things that not many people do. You can say you could have kept Luca, et cetera, et cetera, but no, that's... That, uh, he should not be being bashed. He's one of the best young players in the league. Mm-hmm. I think he's the only player in the Eastern Conference in the top ten in scoring and the top five in assists. I mean, what? what? Come on. And, yeah, Taylor ha- has had some negative things to say about Atlanta sports in general over the years. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, he's never met a 28-3 joke that he didn't like. And he was <laughs> incredibly <laughs> negative about Atlanta getting an MLS team. He admitted yeah. that he was wrong. Uh, but, yeah, he doesn't have a high opinion of Atlanta sports. Um the good thing about him being on a show like that, though, outside of bashing Atlanta sports, is that they are more intentional about including soccer in the conversation. And, and he said on Twitter that that's not him lobbying for it. That's happened. And, and probably because the producers know, hey, we can do this because he's here. I hope that more shows do that. And I hope that, that more producers think that way. Because there are plenty of people, if they're not a soccer guy even, who can talk about it in an informed way because there's plenty of people who are football guys who host daily shows who can talk about baseball you know are they going to go in depth about analytics no but can they talk about baseball to have the conversation yes can they talk about basketball yes they can talk about soccer too producers need to give them a little more credit because it's not that complicated so um it's good that he's it's very good that he's there and he says stuff about atlanta because maybe he believes it, but also to get reactions from people. Yeah. Because uh-huh. it's a it's an easy target. Yes. And then uh, Nathan wraps up his Liverpool rant for the day. Similarly to Atlanta United last year, you can't just blame everything on injuries. Injuries are a reality of sports and cannot be used as a crutch for poor play. But it is a fact that players are gassed because it's so thin. And yet this doesn't really matter. This is a footy podcast on footy as a whole, not a sad Reds podcast. Thanks for letting me vent and humoring me via the Twitters. You can talk about injuries and i don't know why people say that you can't because it's an effect like it's you have an injury to joseph martinez last year it's going to affect the team you have the injuries and the just fatigue that you have right now for a lot of top teams in the world it does have an effect on the team you have to talk about it It, it's the reality for for what affects it it 100 percent does a uh, reminder that intern Nile has an article up on soccerdownhere.net about Marcelo Bielsa's history in Mexico, so check that out. A lot of folks are, are uh, commenting, liking, and passing the word along about that. Uh, Tafka, about negotiations uh, going on with the MLS and the MLSPA. He says, the problem is that the World Cup boom comes in 2027. Both sides want a bigger piece of that. That's why one year wait, wait, seems John, to be a John, 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 John. You, you weren't here for the first hour of the show? I was. We talked about that. I I specifically talked about that tweet. All right. Well, then (laughs) I'll go to Tafka's next one. He says, something that's been pinging around in my head for a few days. Okay. Single entity has absolutely been a saving grace for America. Soccer through difficult times as the sport sought to establish some roots in overly crowded sporting soil. It's also restrained clubs from spending in ways that are unsustainable and provided a paradigm for both parity and league growth. But... The league has now grown to levels that bring into question whether an exodus is possible. With a growing divide between owners who are willing to truly invest and those who are not, could that schism ever create a scenario where MLS's top-shelf club choose to break away and form their own league, either as independent entities or within a franchise model? This alternate reality doesn't seem too far-fetched. It does seem very far-fetched, Tafka, because... They can't break away from 
a business that they hold ownership in. Um, I mean, you could and then and break away from that ownership and start something from scratch that you think could do this. And you've got to have the federation involved in allowing you to do that. And they would probably not look kindly on it. Um, no, I think that the, the scenario that you're, you're laying out, Tafka, is far-fetched. Could you see division between MLS with owners who want to spend more and owners who don't? Absolutely, you could. And, and that's where I could easily see a MLS 1 and MLS 2 kind of scenario. Um, and maybe it is, you know, even not with promotion relegation in it. It's just to have a second division with owners who want to limit their spending. I think more likely, and maybe I'll hit this for myself, is the owners who don't want to spend as much or can't, because I think it's both, will sell out and will sell their teams to people who do want to. And that's how it will grow. Single entity was a necessity. People now who leave that part of the conversation out of it you can't like you have to know how you got here it it was a necessity you were never going to have the investment to get mls off the ground without protection you weren't because there was nobody willing to invest flat out you can live in whatever pollyanna world you want about open system and open soccer and it's all great and it'll all be great and why they do this it should have been this way in 1992 1992 you didn't have anybody spending this kind of money period because nobody wanted to You didn't have anybody really from the heyday of the NASL in the late 70s because people were already trying to figure out ways to cut spending by 80, 81. There were proposals on the table for some pretty wild things in the NASL to limit spending, even to separate, like like we just talked about, with a haves and have-nots kind of conference scenario because they saw the writing on the wall. And when the NASL folded or went on hiatus and never came back uh, ahead of the 85 season, nobody stepped up in an organized big way to spend the money that was needed to launch a first division league until MLS in 96. Now, MLS got its sanctioning at the end of 93. They started really working hard in 94. Things got slowed down because the World Cup took a little bit longer to materialize with money as, as you would have liked. 95 was supposed to be the first year of the league. It got pushed back a year because you didn't have enough investment. Now, you had a few people at that time who said, we want an open league and we'll invest more if there's an open league. There were more people who said, we'll invest more if it is a capped single entity league. And MLS set a new pathway for startup leagues because most startup leagues that you have seen since have been single entity leagues. You know, you've seen a lot of this with lacrosse, uh, with, you know, other sports. You know, I I think, I want to say some smaller hockey leagues, but I might be wrong. Um, I think arena football went to kind of a single entity. doesn't mean it works, but it's a safer way to start because you're better protected. That's why you are where you are. Do you need to open up more spending? A hundred percent you do. But you've got to do it in a reasonable way. Because again, you look around the world, EFL has salary caps. La Liga has more control over spending to keep clubs from doing what Barcelona has somehow managed to do to themselves. You have a greater push for caps and organization like this. Portugal, we talked about the centralized broadcast plan that they're doing. Italy's doing it. That's taken a page out of the Soccer United marketing book which happened later in MLS's development. It was four or five years down the road, and it took advantage of an opportunity because the marketing partner for the league in U.S. soccer was going under, and somebody had to do it. So the league put together this with their ownership, and it also was involving World Cup TV rights and a bunch of different things that came together, and it's been a huge benefit for the league. Now you're seeing other leagues around the world do it. I don't think MLS just breaks away from doing it because they're not here if they don't, but they have to spend more. And if that means you have to create a division between teams who want to spend more and teams who don't, yes. I do believe that the narrative out there in this whole CBA negotiation that you have a group of owners who are fighting to stop the season because they don't want to spend money, I think that is incredibly overplayed. I do think there are some owners who want to not 
increase spending as fast as others do. That's played out. We've seen that. But I think the idea of not playing or, you know, folding your teams or stuff like that, that they're not having a season, all that stuff doesn't make any sense. They'll sell before anything happens, and new owners will come in and want to spend more. That's my impression. That's my understanding yeah. of how things will go from following the history of it and following the, the tea leaves that are out there now. But it's also just my opinion, so we'll see. I think that you'll always have you'll always have owners who will see the success in any business, and then they will want to get into that success. And I think that MLS will be no different. I think that when you see how franchise values have increased and skyrocketed to the points of where they are over the last handful of years, I think that you're going to see folks, A, who will want out, B, you'll have folks who will be just as interested to get in on what they've been seeing with the league over the last handful of years. Yeah, because you've got franchise valuations that are blowing up and are even surpassing the valuation that's in Forbes. You're you're seeing things really start to blow up quickly with that. So I think people will sell before it gets to that point. Um, it's not... It's not like you can just say if you are a league, we break away and we're going to do what we want to do. You got to get sanctioning through U.S. soccer, which means you can have FIFA windows and bring players in from other clubs that are through FIFA, which you're not going to do if you can't do that. You've got to get a lot of things in place to have a breakaway. And these teams don't exist outside of MLS right now. So, I mean, it's not, it's just, it's, I, I don't see that. That feels like a, a fantasy dream. I think it's far more likely that the owners who don't want to spend as much just sell out and, and just move on. That's what I'm expecting. Uh, yeah, Tafka says if they reach a deal, here's a silver lining to all the CBA crap. If they reach a deal, we don't have to do this crap again for seven years. Yeah, six or seven. Uh, it'll be good. It'll it'll be bad when that comes around because then we'll, we'll bring up all this stuff and pull out quotes and it'll be back and forth. But that's every CBA negotiation at this point. So, I mean, if MLS is in this world where CBA negotiations get bad at times, I guess that means you're all grown up. I guess Vince Vaughn is standing on the table at the diner and swingers and, and yelling at John Favreau that you're all grown up and you're all grown up and you're all grown up. Uh, well, maybe that's MLS these days. Um, yay, we're happy for you, but can you be even more grown up and not have this continue, please? In the first place, yeah. Four, four, four. Uh, no, it's going to happen. No, 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 no. It's going to happen in the first place. Don't give me that because it's going on in MLB right now. It goes on in the NFL every time there's a CBA. It goes on in the NBA. It goes on in every league and every organization that has a CBA negotiation. So no, MLS is not unique in that no. aspect. No, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, be proactive instead of being reactive and waiting to the bitter end. But none to, of to them are proactive, on. John. That's the point. Is that MLS is doing what they've watched all these other leagues do? I learned it from you, man. Yeah. That's what MLS is doing with this. The MLSPA and MLS is they're doing what MLB and all these other leagues have done. MLB did it just last summer. I mean, that whole back and forth was absurd. Um, update from Ecuador. Gracias, El Jefe. El Mataflo. Uh, the Ecuadorian Super Cup has been postponed. Everyone agreed to do it in the second half of the year for the safety of all involved. So that's why games are showing up postponed, but others are showing up being played. It is not happening. So no fight TV for you. Sorry. Uh, Nathan Pugh has, is not a fan about all of our thoughts about coffee this morning. I don't really like coffee that much. I don't either. And uh, Five Stripe Daily posted something into the timeline. I pushed it to the Discord so folks can comment on it there as well. Okay. A, a tweet from Dan Baldessere. 90s goalkeepers as birds. And so he has... Keeper in a kit and a matching bird, and so Bruh. I pushed it to the Discord. So, uh, so he had like uh, David Seaman, Jorge Campos, and did that. So I put it to the Discord. So if folks wanted to comment on that, that they could do that as well. Higita, David James, Oliver Kahn, Kareen, Kevin Pressman, Simon Royce, and so basically taking them in one of their most outrageous jerseys and comparing them to. The feathers of a bird. So I put that in the, the timeline. Okay, we've got a rumor that we will touch on before we go, and it's okay. uh, it's a new one. You, uh, one other thing uh, with a league that's not intending to play games, uh, Montreal Club de Foot Montreal didn't just stop at adding Jarrett's favorite player. Uh, they have added Joaquin Torres from Newell's Old Boys, um, a player that at one point was linked to Atlanta United. Like I think everybody who's come from Newell's has at some point. 
Uh, they've added him. That's a, a good signing. Joaquin Torres is a, a very talented winger. But there's a rumor involving Atlanta United out of Argentina, which is, again, not a surprise. It is coming from a periodista, Gustavo Yarroc, who works with ESPN, works with Radio La Red. Um, maybe not a Tier 1 source because just it hasn't come up as much because Atlanta hasn't been as involved with the clubs that I think Gustavo really focuses on. But 65.9 thousand followers, so there can be some trust here. Uh, Gustavo Yarroc says that Atlanta United is interested, um, comes charging to translate, for Santiago Sosa, who is a midfielder at River Plate. Valued, according to Transfer Marked, at $7.37 million. He's played for Argentina's U-20s. He is 21 years old, a defensive midfielder. Uh, primarily, according to Transfer Marked, has played in that defensive midfield six role. Um, developed at River, hasn't been at any other clubs. There is uh, another tweet out there, Atlanta United Fan TV has it. I haven't confirmed it yet that there is a release clause of £20 million pounds, um, on him. River has 100% of the rights developed at River, so that, that part makes it clean. It's not like the other situations that we talked about. But go back to the other situation we talked about, because I think it's important. River owes Ignacio Fernandez top player for them. Owes him money. They're looking to make a sale. Well, Atletico Mineiro is looking to buy. Um, partially because they owe him money. We've talked about River and some of their situations before. Marcelo Gallardo did not immediately say, like, I'm back. All's good. We're continuing. We're going to go win Libertadores this year. We're going to go win the domestic trophy for the first time in a long time. I'm back. He wanted to talk to the club about what are y'all going to do with this roster? Because you've got some guys who are out of contract in the summer, and you need to make some money. River is not the old school millonarios that they used to be and had all the money. That's Boca now. River is not in a great financial position. So a player who is on the fringes, I mean, he's 21, so that's to be expected. Uh, He's got 21 first-team games, according to Transfer Marked. With the team, seven in the Libertadores, uh, six or eight in the uh, Copa Diego Maradona, and six in the Super League prior. Uh, just over eleven hundred minutes played for the first team. Um, you know, I mean, Rivers there to win trophies now. Gajardo is, wants to win now, and if they need money now, is it a feasible possibility? Yes, it checks the boxes of believability. Does that mean it's going to happen? No, we don't know. Uh, You have Franco Ibarra, who has said on radio in Argentina that he's happy to come to Atlanta United. He's excited about it, et cetera, et cetera. Similar player. 19 years old for Ibarra. 21 years old for Sosa. So, could you do it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, international spots, of course, that's an issue. U22 initiative? Well, um, that part is good... For Ibarra, it's not good for Sosa, but if you're talking, trying to do the math real fast, because we don't know what's actually going to happen in terms of a transfer fee here, he's valued at 7 plus, and he's got a release clause at 20 million pounds, which would be more than that, which nobody's going to pay right now, you would think he'd be a designated player which would mean Moreno would be bought down, which would mean you're not worried about the U22 initiative because he turns 22 in May. So he wouldn't qualify for the U22 initiative from what we know. If you turn 22 in the year, you can't be in that spot. But he could be a designated player, and Moreno could be bought down, as has been talked about before. Everybody's expecting that. That has kind of been out there that would be an expectation. You don't do it until you have the guy to buy. This would potentially be the guy to buy. So that has popped off here at... The last 20 minutes or so out of Argentina, uh, Golasso Argentina has an update on it as well, just in English. Uh, reports that Atlanta United are close to signing uh, Santiago Sosa. It had been reported that MLS was close to him before, didn't have a club name attached to it. Now, according to Gustavo Yarroc, that it would be Atlanta United. Uh, Golasso Argentino says that given how the 21-year-old proved he could play a variety of roles, it must be an offer too good to turn down. And when you combine their financial position with an offer that could be pretty good, 
it all clicks. But he has primarily played as a defensive midfielder. Uh, does this mean you're not getting Ibotter? I don't think so. It just means you might be getting another player and a really good one. And you're being ambitious and bold and strong. And yeah, this feels like a pretty big deal because he's a very promising young player, part of Argentina's U20. So there you go. That's the rumor that is new. We will keep you posted on it. Uh, we're not doing a three hour show <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I've got some basketball talk to do this afternoon. If you oh, nice. missed uh, me and Mike. And Andy Bunker, talking Hawks and NBA last week. Uh, Thursdays at 3, the No Swag Shop uh, is live on Atlanta uh, on the 92.9 The Game's Facebook page. Uh, Facebook.com slash 92.9 The Game. 3 o'clock, I'm the point guard. I'm just hosting. I am uh, asking the questions and, and giving some opinions. I'll, I'll take a few shots. But uh, Mike and Andy will fill us in on what happened last night with the Hawks. Losing to Dallas, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about courtside Karen and that uh-huh. whole bit of ridiculousness. I don't think she has a reality show yet. Um, Give it time. But we'll get you filled in on everything uh, Hawks and NBA at 3 o'clock. So I've got some prep work to do. I've also got some studying to do on Santiago Sosa. We will talk about that tomorrow morning. Tonight we will have another uh, Q&A in the Discord for subscribers. If you're a subscriber on Twitch, if you're a subscriber on Patreon, you are part of our Discord. If you don't have the invite, please let me know so I can get that to you. Uh, send me a message on Twitter at Long Shoe. Send us a message at Soccer Down Here. We'll get you squared away. That'll be at 7 o'clock tonight. Q&A uh, last week was really fun. Kind of like a Reddit AMA kind of thing in the Discord for subscribers. So 7 o'clock for that. 3 o'clock for Basketball Talk on 92.9 The Game's Facebook page. 9 a.m. tomorrow for our latest soccer down here and midnight tonight is the deadline for mls and the players association to deal with this whole cba thing and i hope that they meet the deadline because i don't want to talk about this all day tomorrow but i know we're going to so until then mucha platio mucha platio